So my main interest at the time was exploring the cave. I wanted to know what it was, how far it went. There are bronze weapons in there, swords, spears, shields, knives, many artifacts, something like 7,000. No two are exactly the same. It proves that many of the things that have been taught in elementary school, high school, and colleges is wrong. They were treasure hunters searching for that cave. So I decided to completely hide its location. Search all you want, you'll never find it. The history that we were all taught growing up is wrong. My name is Scott Walter, and I'm a forensic geologist. There's a hidden history in this country that nobody knows about. There are pyramids here, chambers, tombs, inscriptions. They're all over this country. We're gonna investigate these artifacts and sites, and we're gonna get to the truth. Sometimes history isn't what we've been told. Our country is filled with caves, caverns, and burial chambers that could hide artifacts and sacred wonders from long ago. I've looked for the Ark of the Covenant, the Holy Grail, and other things rumored to be hidden here. I think these things are just waiting to be found by those who search hard enough. Without a doubt, some of the greatest lost treasures of all time are those from ancient Egypt where vast burial chambers lie virtually empty, the pharaoh's riches having vanished. Many people believe these old world artifacts were brought to the new world, and I think they could be right. A few years ago, I examined some alleged Egyptian artifacts said to have been found in a cave in rural Illinois. But Illinois isn't the only place said to hide such treasures. That's why I'm heading to another place where many think ancient Egyptians once came with their vast riches, the Grand Canyon. Stretching 277 miles, the Grand Canyon is about 18 miles wide and up to 6,000 feet deep. It was carved out by the Colorado River about 500 million years ago and the layering of the rock reveals a huge amount of our nation's geological history. And there are caves here, but only a few of them have been explored. So if ancient Egyptians brought their treasure here, it's likely still hidden, and I'm meeting a guy who says he knows where it is. Jerry, thanks for meeting me here today in this amazing place. It is. It's very amazing. You know, there are many myths and stories about ancient cultures coming to America with fantastic treasures. Some people say that there's a treasure buried here somewhere in the Grand Canyon. And I have a newspaper article from the Phoenix Gazette in 1909 that talks about a treasure here. Let's take a look at this. Explorations in Grand Canyon Mysteries of immense, rich cavern being brought to light. Remarkable finds indicate ancient people migrated from the Orient. And that's amazing. Yeah, it is. And you know, the person who did this exploration was G.E. Kincaid. He'd been hired by the Smithsonian, and he went pretty much looking for this cave full of treasure and this lost city that's down there. Did he find it? And, and what happened after that? Kincaid knew what he was looking for. He pretty much went to the spot found a series of steps that went up the cliff wall, went into the cave. He found not only hieroglyphs, but he found all kinds of artifacts. Like what? Well, it was statuary. There were mummies in there. There were, indeed, pieces of uh, gold and silver. Now, one of the things they mention here is that 
this particular cave is virtually inaccessible. Although it does talk about 1,400, 1,500 steps, sandstone steps that were carved into the rock that would allow them to, to get there. The other thing that's amazing to me is, according to the article, this cave is so massive that 50,000 people could have lived there. So potentially there could have been thousands, if not millions, of artifacts inside this cave. And the fact that we look around here and we see this geology, we know we've got sandstone, limestone, it's going to lend itself to caves. And I know that there's a lot of caves here. So, you know, that fits. But today, the Smithsonian's official position is that this whole story is a hoax. Is that correct? We contacted the Smithsonian. They deny that there's a cave, that there's any evidence, that there was anything here. So are you suggesting that the Smithsonian is covering up something here in the Grand Canyon? Oh, they absolutely are. Because I know that you've done a lot of work out here. You've made some expeditions here. What did you find? Well, we came here trying to find the truth. Kathy, my wife, did the research over a number of years and finally pinpointed a spot that we believe is exactly where this would need to be if it truly existed. So where is that location? You know, this is a really difficult place to get to, Scott. It isn't easy at all. But yeah, I can show you where we believe the cave is at. So you're up for it. I'd be happy to show you what we know. Jerry, what makes you so sure that you know where this site is? Well, once we got to the site that Kathy had identified, we started looking very closely at anything that might have been left behind by the Smithsonian explorers and excavation team that had been there ahead of us. Mm -hmm. We found buttons, pieces of glassware, a name badge, uh, several small pieces that were 80 to 100 years old. So do you think this corresponds with the expedition back in 1909? Yeah, I do. Now this this place is very dangerous. Why do you say that? Well, it's dangerous because while we were there on several occasions, there were government stealth helicopters. Stealth helicopters? Seriously? They know it's there, Scott. And we know that they know it's there. So do you think they were trying to scare you off? I know they were trying to scare us off. <laughs> Let me tell you this. If there's an ancient site somewhere down in the Grand Canyon, possibly Egyptian, they're not going to scare me off. Ancient Egypt is famous for its vast riches and immense wealth. When King Tut's tomb was discovered in 1922, his coffin alone was made from solid gold and was worth over $13 million. Much of the treasure attributed to Egyptian pharaohs has yet to be found. So what I want to know is, could it be here in America? If it was hidden away on US soil, some people think it's in the Grand Canyon. An old news article suggests Egyptian treasure was found here, and another treasure might be here too, the Ark of the Covenant. My search for the religious relic turned up clues nearby in Arizona's Petrified Forest National Park. If any treasure is here in the canyon, it's in an incredibly dangerous and inaccessible spot, possibly even guarded by the government. But the reward is too great, and I have to find out what's hidden here. There were things that were going on that just didn't make any sense for such a remote location. I want to find this thing wherever it is, and I need your help. This area where the cave is located is considered sacred ground by the Hopi, Navajo, Zuni, and other tribes of this area. Do you think that maybe they might have some information that could be helpful to us? Well, I know someone who might have some answers fill in the blanks. The Zuni tribe are Pueblo people who have made the Southwest their home for hundreds of years. To the Zuni, the Grand Canyon is a holy place, their creation story telling how the ancestors climbed up from its basin. Even today, 
Zuni men still make pilgrimages to the Grand Canyon to venerate this sacred site. Clifford, as a Zuni tribal elder, what can you tell me about the Grand Canyon, what it means to your people? Well, the Grand Canyon, to the Zuni people and other Pueblo tribes, this is considered our <clears throat> place of origin, not only in terms of religion, but also spirituality, about where our forefathers and our ancient ones came out of. Is there anything in your creation stories um, that talks about some of these mysterious caves, maybe even the one that could possibly hold Egyptian artifacts? In our spiritual teachings, there are actually rooms inside the Grand Canyon, and there's several passageways. Right. So that parallels with some of the history about the early 1900s, and also about some of the, the treasures that a lot of Indian tribes talked about. Are there any stories about what might be in some of these caves? Uh, I've heard a lot of uh, different uh, stories from different tribes that talk about these treasures that are supposedly in there. But then also I heard about a pyramid that's supposedly inside the Grand Canyon. A pyramid? A pyramid. So Clifford, your oral stories say that there were cities inside of these caves and pyramids in the Grand Canyon. I absolutely believe in that because there's been a lot of different uh, crossing of different cultures this part of the world. It's my understanding that there was a lot of Egyptian type uh, relics and um, artifacts that were taken from the, inside the Grand Canyon. Are there any stories about any of these caves being cursed? In most uh, Native American sites, there are natural occurrences that might be considered cursed. It's sort of like a guardian type mm. uh, thing, and it's still even in existence to this day. You have to tread very carefully. Absolutely. So do you think there still could be treasure down there? Oh, absolutely. This is a huge place. <laughs> and if you look at the rooms and the, the space inside the canyon itself, there's a lot of artifacts of past civilizations. I believe in that, that there's a lot of treasure still inside the canyon. Do you think we can get there? Well, you might try getting there, but it's very dangerous. Well, you know, I appreciate what uh, Clifford was saying, but I'm not ready to give up yet. We have to figure out a way to get into that cave. Well, it's a very dangerous place. Clifford was right. I have some video to show you of our 2002 expedition into the canyon. It'll show you exactly how dangerous a place this is. Sounds good. Let's take a look. This is our camp from our 2002 expedition when we were at the Grand Canyon trying to find a way down to the area where Kincaid's cave would be found. It looks like it drops right off, right? Beyond this point is just a sheer 2,000 foot drop off. People standing here on the edge of the canyon, past that point, it is straight down maybe 2,000 feet. It's just what I'm seeing here does look, I mean, that's, that's a pretty steep slope. It, it's absolutely dangerous, absolutely dangerous. And here you see, now they've gone over the edge, they're hanging off the ropes, they've gone down maybe 800 feet, and and this one fellow is just hanging off the rope. They're suffering heat exhaustion. There's no way you can carry enough water to get to this place. So basically what you're saying is to get to this cave, I mean, it's virtually impossible. It is. All right, what you're looking at here is uh, while our team was going down, descending into the canyon over these cliffs, you can see very clearly. Holy crap. There's this unmarked plane that's flying well below the canyon rim. Uh, rim. As you see it going right through there. We've also seen helicopters, and they've buzzed us at various times we've been there. They don't, they don't have any markings either, and we feel they must be government helicopters, government airplanes. They were watching us. Or maybe they were trying to scare you off. Probably trying to. So they never did get down to the cave entrance? They never did. Yeah, it, it proved to be way too difficult. Heat exhaustion took over, and it was really very difficult to get them back to the surface. 
do you think that we could climb down here realistically? No. I mean, how long would that take? What are we talking about time-wise? You need expert mountaineers and a lot of rope. Well, you know what? There might be another way to get there. All right. What do you have in mind? 400 Kenny ground, wind 1806, left turn eastbound, approved runway 21, clear for takeoff. And Candy, after 49, boost ready. Got 49, the entire stage close to southeast. After 49, let's go for a southeast departure. exactly where you need me to go. Yeah, it's just right down there below that ridge. So I'm going to do an orbit. I'm going to lose a little bit of altitude here okay. and do an orbit over the location. 1046, Nankway 519, climbing 95. And Eagle 49 is over the little Colorado River. Right there. We need to descend down below that ridge line in order to see directly across into the canyon. I can't do that. The FAA has restricted all flight below the canyon rim not allowed to descend down there. So you're telling me that the FAA, the government, will not allow us to go down there? Absolutely not. down below that ridge line in order to see directly across. The FAA has restricted all flight below the canyon rim. Not allowed to descend down there. So you're saying that the government will not allow us to fly over this area right here? This is where the Egyptian cave is supposed to be? No, sir. We're not allowed down there. That's the level that we think that the cave is at, right there. Okay just beyond that next drop off. That next, exactly. So Jerry, we are pretty much above it, on top of it, do you think? Yeah, there's the uh, circle of rocks from our campsite. Is there any way that we could get down on that plateau just above it? Could you, could you land there? We can land on the top. I can get you on that plateau right over there. Okay, well that would, I guess that's the next best thing. Well, I'm gonna go ahead and just land right down there. And 978 Eagle 49 is uh, landing. I'll call you back up in the air. So Jerry, this was your base camp right here, right? This is where you started your operation to get down to what you hoped was the Egyptian cave? This is it. When we were here before, the guys that were going over, we thought they were prepared. We really didn't know what it would take at the time. And they went down about 800 feet, and they ended up getting stuck. 800 feet, that's only about, what, halfway down to where you think the cave is? It's about halfway, yeah. Going over the side, it just seems impossible. You can't see the cave from the bottom, nor can you see it from the top. It's at an in-between level. It's completely obscured. 
That newspaper article is very compelling from 1909. Something happened here in the Grand Canyon. I think the government is hiding something. The fact that a plane flew by when you guys were down here repelling tells me that they had to have been watching you. They're guarding something. The oral stories of the Zuni and other tribes uh, around the Grand Canyon clearly suggest that some people came here, that there are many caves here, but there may be caves that housed ancient cultures and maybe artifacts, possibly the Egyptians. So I'm convinced that there is something here. Well, we've only scratched the surface, and we're sure that there were ancient cultures who came through here. It could have been the Egyptians. We think it was someone from the Orient. There's some talk that even the Ark of the Covenant might have come through here. You know, I recently was in the petrified forest, and I saw a petroglyph that looked just like the Ark of the Covenant. So maybe the Ark of the Covenant did come to North America through the petrified forest. Maybe it's down there in that cave. After taking a good look around, it's clear that further exploration is impossible. It frustrates me not to reach this cave. But it isn't the only cave in America rumored to hide Egyptian treasure. There's another cave in southern Illinois. And while I've studied artifacts allegedly taken from it, I've never seen the cave itself. I met the man who claims he found this cave, Russell Burroughs, and I even got his story on camera. They were people searching for that cave, treasure hunters. So I had decided that the best thing to do is to completely hide its location, which I did. Now he won't talk to me at all. But maybe it's time to go look for the cave and see once and for all if Russell was telling the truth. You know, speaking of treasures, there's another cave in southern Illinois, Burroughs Cave. I'm sure you've heard of it. We have. I've actually spent quite a bit of time looking at the artifacts, but I've never found the cave, and that's where I'm headed next. I want to find Burroughs Cave. <laughs> If I can find Burroughs Cave, it would be a huge step toward proving Egyptian treasure really did make it to America. And that's why I need to visit someone who may know just how to find it. Harry Hubbard, an artifact collector and researcher who's devoted his life to studying the Illinois Treasure Cave. Harry has some examples of the treasures that he's eager for me to see. This is amazing. It looks like the greatest hoard of treasure I've ever seen in person. But they're not gold. These are made of lead, right? That's correct. These are replicas of original gold pieces brought out in 1985. What happened to all the gold? Where is it? These are replicas. Right. Well, Burroughs melted the gold and then sold it off. Oh, really? Yes. OK. You know, I'm seeing Egyptian iconography. I'm seeing some interesting text, a sun god symbol. To see all this stuff that you have here and to think that it was actual gold treasure at one time is amazing. I mean, it's got to be one of the greatest hoards in history. The original pieces came from here in Marion County. OK. There's an ancient tomb very nearby. OK. The cave, right? The cave. All right. Tell me about the cave. The original description indicated that there were 13 crypts. OK. The main crypt had a king and a solid gold sarcophagus. And there was one crypt that actually had a woman in it. Hmm. And the rest were ancient kings. 13 cadavers buried in one crypt. So you're convinced that, that the gold that came out was real? Oh, yes, most definitely. Well, let's get back to Russell Burroughs. Okay. He's the guy that told me fantastic stories about pulling out uh, not just gold artifacts, but uh, artifacts uh, carved and made out of stone. I've talked to him about these artifacts. And did you study those artifacts? Absolutely, I did. What did you determine? Well, I can tell you with absolute certainty that I think I know what's behind this notorious mystery of the Illinois cave and how it might connect with the Grand Canyon cave that I just looked at.
I'm on the hunt for Egyptian treasure that legends say is buried somewhere in America. The big question is, where is it? I've checked out a prohibited area at the Grand Canyon in Arizona. And now I'm examining replicas of possible Egyptian artifacts found in another cavernous hiding place here in Southern Illinois. Legend says the original gold and the other carved pieces were taken from a cave here in the 1980s. But whether this is a true story or a tall tale remains to be seen. I've spent years trying to get to the truth myself. In 2010, I managed to get the only interview of Russell Burroughs ever known to be filmed, and I examined some of the artifacts he claimed he found. The varied collection ranged from a shaman and a cartouche carved in black marble to a white marble stone with the Greek goddess Isis on it. But after I questioned their authenticity, Russell refused to speak with me again. The key to the mysterious cave in Illinois here really centers on Russell Burroughs. I mean, he's the one that made the cave famous. That's why they call it Burroughs Cave. Uh, he is the reason that a lot of people have become skeptical of the artifacts, because a lot of them have been tainted and forged. You know, I felt it was important to give Russell an opportunity to say something about it, so I interviewed him back in 2010. I'd like to see what he's got to say. Well, in 1982, uh, I was uh, out working with my metal detector searching for an old homestead. I was walking down the, the trail on the bluff and I uh, stepped on a rock which uh, dropped me into a pit or a hole. And lo and behold, behind it was a cave. There are bronze weapons in there, swords, spears, shields, knives, many artifacts, many, many, something like 7,000. No two are exactly the same. Well, that's quite a story, isn't it? This one is different from the rest of them. Oh, really? Yes. The story changes quite frequently. Well, one of the things that does jump out at me is his descriptions of what he sees in the cave are incredibly detailed. Well, Burroughs describes 13 crypts. The main crypt is a man in a solid gold sarcophagus. Do you I, think... belie I believe he saw those things. Well, I have an artifact I want to show you. That's the Isis stone. Uh, an Egyptian-looking female who's kneeling in reverence to Ra, the sun god. And this is an artifact that, uh, if you look closer, um, is very revealing. You look right here, you can see that there are some carved characters here. Mm -hmm. This is English cursive writing. Mm -hmm. Why would English writing be on an ancient Egyptian artifact? That's problem number one. This particular stone is exactly two inches thick, as are most modern white marble tombstones used between about 1850 and 1950, mm -hmm. very commonly used at that time. But it gets more interesting after that. If you look at this kind of dark gray material, mm -hmm. that's actually modern mortar. Okay. The next thing that happened here is you see these chips on the backside? Right. Somebody chipped the backside, apparently to try to remove the inscriptions on the back and make it look old. So there's no question in my mind that this is a fake artifact and that it was made from a modern white marble tombstone. But that doesn't mean that the cave doesn't exist. In fact, That's it could true. very well exist. And I have a couple of artifacts that I want to show you that Russell claims came from his cave. It looks like uh, perhaps it's an Egyptian shaman. It's got the Egyptian beard. It has a very creepy look to it. And it could very well be authentic. Who knows? This is another artifact that looks very interesting to me. Right. This is a cartouche, an Egyptian cartouche. Yes, it is. And in most cases, a cartouches carry the names of a pharaoh or somebody of importance. Well, these two are, are authentic. There's no doubt in my mind. There's not that many people that know Egyptian glyph. And the ones that are carved in Egyptian glyph, the uh, grammar, syntax, everything is pretty much correct. After looking at all these artifacts here, looking at all the replicas of the gold, imagining this vast treasure underground, my question to you is, do you think the cave is real? I know the cave is real. 
and we know how all this came over here. Come on, let me show you something. Okay. This is the man who brought all the treasures over here from Egypt. Oh, really? Yes. And who is this? His name is Alexander Helios. He is the missing son of Cleopatra and Mark Anthony. Alexander Helios was an Egyptian prince whose famous parents, Antony and Cleopatra, committed suicide when a Roman emperor conquered Egypt. Alexander Helios, as the eldest son, may have feared for his life and fled the country with the family fortune. At the time, Egypt had many sailing ships, so perhaps Helios came to what's now America to seek refuge, bringing his treasure with him. All right, so why did he come over here? One of the stones clearly says, we left the Mediterranean to escape persecution. And he's all over these artifacts, probably on about 500 of them. And it tells his life story here. After about age 10, he vanishes off of the face of history. Okay. But here we have him as an older man, as a younger man, in different uh, costumes. He was a priest of the sun, and that was his name, Helios, which, which is Greek for the sun. OK. So you think he came here? Yes. And um, when was this? Probably about 25 BC. Well, that's very interesting. And how many people do you think came with him? According to the tablets, probably 50,000. 50,000 people. Well, that's pretty interesting because when I was out at the uh, cave in the Grand Canyon, they talked about it being big enough to house 50,000 people. And maybe the cave that you have here that you think is here, maybe those people also went out to the Grand Canyon. So what do you think of the theory that Alexander Helios came here to North America with all these treasures? Well, it's interesting for a couple of reasons. One is Helios and the people you talked about are real historic figures. And the fact is, they did disappear from the pages of history. And they had to go somewhere. Why not here? So I like it from that standpoint. But I need to see more evidence before I'm convinced. I mean, mm -hmm. these are great, but I need to find that cave. Do you know where that cave is? Yes, we know where the cave is. All right, show me. Now, this map came from the file cabinet of one of Russell Burroughs's associates. I've been researching this for 20 years, and there's been a few things that I was wrong about here and there, but the location of this tomb is not one of them. OK. This is what we call the pinpoint map. All right, so this is his secret map, right? This is Russell Burroughs' <laughs> secret map. And if you'll notice, there's a ravine system here. And right here, there's dots right here. And also, there's a red dot right here. OK. There's a cavern in one ravine and a large room underneath the ground of the other one. OK. And I'm going to put an X right there and right there. So X marks the spot. You got it. How far away is this uh, ravine system? About four and a half miles away. Well, Harry, if you're right, I've got to get out there and find this cave. You know, there's always truth in legend. We have to get to the truth, and that's what I'm going to find. Some people believe that ancient Egyptians may have come to America with their treasure. And now, I'm searching for these caves that may hide these amazing artifacts. I visited the Grand Canyon, where it's believed there were caverns of vast riches from afar. And here in Illinois, I've examined replicas of the many Egyptian artifacts that are said to have come from Burroughs Cave. When I saw them, I said to myself, where in the world are these from? Using the secret treasure map that Harry Hubbard gave me, I've tracked down the landowner of the area on the map. And although Harry wasn't allowed on the site, I've been given access. And if there's a cave here, I'm going to find it. I'm investigating the possibility of Egyptians bringing treasure to America. I was just out in the Grand Canyon, and I uh, investigated a mysterious cave that is uh, alleged to contain treasures. And now I'm here in southern Illinois investigating the Burroughs Cave Mystery, another Egyptian treasure 
uh, possibility here. What do you think about all this? I think it's a very fantastic legend. How could people from the Middle East have made it across the Atlantic up to Mississippi and have found this spot here out in the middle of nowhere? I can appreciate your skepticism, but there is an historical figure called Alexander Helios, who about 2,000 years ago did disappear from the pages of history. And he was uh, of Egyptian heritage. He did have ships. He did have a following. And the question is, where did he go? The other thing that is really interesting and compelling to me is that there are at least 7,000 artifacts that reportedly did come from Burroughs Cave. Uh, I've seen a couple thousand of them myself, and some of them are quite ornate and beautiful, and they had to come from somewhere. Those are two things that do intrigue me. But um, I want to hear more about what you have here. And this is supposed to be the area where the cave is. What do you know about it? Well, let me show you on uh, my aerial view here, my property here. Okay. Uh, we have the road to the north that we entered here, and we're parked right here at the edge of the, uh, the woods and this okay. open field. And there's supposedly two ravines where these uh, Egyptian tombs or caverns are, are supposed to be located. Okay. I do have a map here that I'd like to compare with your map. Okay. So <clears throat> here it should, looks like it's right here. So that would put us, these are the two ravines you're talking about right here. Correct. So apparently, this is where Burroughs Cave is, is located. That's what most people believe, yes. Are you willing to take me in there? Yes, I am, Scott. Discovering Burroughs Cave here in Illinois would be the find of the century. But the questions surrounding the veracity of the artifacts discovered are a problem for most everyone, including me. I want to know, did Russell Burroughs really find and conceal this cave, or did it ever exist at all? His own accounts suggest it's off a trail near some bluffs, just like the bluffs on Stevens Land, so I think we're in the right area. Burroughs said he slipped into a pit that led him into a long treasure cave. My examination of the geology here will be key. If there's not a cave here, then I need to analyze the rock to see if there could be one underground. Well, Scott, this is the West Ravine. That is a natural rock shelter. Does it go under here, too? Yes, there's a ledge underneath where we're standing. Pretty impressive, actually. Can we get down there? I sure would like to look around here a little more. Yeah, there's a trail over here to our right that leads down into the ravine. The first thing I can say is the rock shelter in the ravine is not a cave, but a cave entrance discovered back in 1982 might have become hidden by a rockfall or overgrown by trees in the 30 years since Burroughs first found it. I'm not ready to give up on the idea ancient Egyptians might have come here and tunneled out deep into rock. But to find out if that's possible, I'll need to test the rock type. So Scott, here we're at the spot that was marked as an X on your map, but I don't see any caverns or, or uh, chambers or anything. I see a lot of sandstone that's been naturally eroded by water right. over hundreds of years here. Well, you're right. and. You know, looking at the map, it was a very small scale map, and that dot that was put on there, and it may be on the correct spot, it may not. You know, one of the things I'd like to get a sense of is how well compacted this sandstone is, how strong it is. Could they have tunneled through this following fractures and maybe taking advantage of natural, you know, openings in the rock? You know what I want to do is I want to see what is holding those sand grains together. You see anything, Scott? Yeah. I'm seeing sand grains that appear to have little or no cement. That's why this stuff is pretty soft. Uh-huh. Yeah, this piece is just crumbling in my hands. Right, right. 
There's one more test that I would like to do, though. What we have here is dilute hydrochloric acid. I want to see if there's any calcite cement, and if it's there, it'll fizz. So let's see. So it's like they're being absorbed into the rock. Yeah. It's soaking in quickly, which means there's little, if any, cement. It's an open space between okay. the sand grains. This rock, in fact, does lend itself to carving caves. You know, I've been to places where I would say absolutely not, uh -huh. but here I would say it's possible. So, Scott, what does it all mean? Well, what it means to me is could ancient cultures, conceivably from Egypt, have come here to your property and carved caves and put Egyptian treasure in them? Yes, I think they could have. Being a realist, I'm not sure I believe that the Russell's Cave or the Mystery Tomb ever existed. Mm -hmm. And I think this thing's sort of been perpetuated by the fact that uh, Southern Illinois has the nickname as Little Egypt that's been around since the early 1800s. There's various things that have that word Egyptian in them, like uh, the local newspaper has uh, pyramids on it and there's pictures of the Sphinx. And then as, as a coincidence, the town at the confluence of the Mississippi and Ohio is named Cairo. For anybody to have come over from the Middle East, made it all the way over here across the Atlantic and much less down in Illinois, it would be just uh, the most uh, fantastic voyage in the history of mankind. Well, you think it's geographically far-fetched that the Egyptians could have come here to the heartland of America, but I'm not ready to give up on that idea just yet. In fact, I firmly believe that there were many cultures that came here prior to Columbus, going back thousands of years. So it's certainly possible that the ancient Egyptians did come here to America. We just need to find more proof. There are incredible stories that ancient Egyptians somehow made their way to what is now the United States. But from all that I've seen, I think that behind these legends is an astounding truth. At the Grand Canyon, I heard from a descendant of some of Arizona's earliest inhabitants about encounters with ancient travelers from the east. It's a story echoed by the earliest European explorers who found clues to an Egyptian voyage that I think the government may be covering up. I saw an amazing account of a Smithsonian expedition to uncover a wealth of Egyptian treasures hidden in a cave large enough for 50,000 men. Maybe the 50,000 men, whom some believe were led here by the son of Antony and Cleopatra. I think the Illinois Treasure Cave and the cave in the Grand Canyon could very possibly be real. The geology proves beyond a doubt that ancient people could have carved hiding places for their vast treasures in both locations. This great land we know as America has many natural treasures, and I'm absolutely convinced that it's been drawing people here for thousands of years. that we were all taught growing up is wrong. My name is Scott Walter, and I'm a forensic geologist. There's a hidden history in this country that nobody knows about. There are pyramids here, chambers, tombs, inscriptions. They're all over this country. We're gonna investigate these artifacts and sites, and we're gonna get to the truth. Sometimes history isn't what we've been told.
this is Scott Walter. I'm on vacation this week. Leave a message and I'll call you when I get back. Grant, he's fallen like five times. <laughs> it looks fun though. I might go out there in a little bit and give it a try. I can, I can do that. Well, I don't know. Excuse me, have you seen any of these? Oh, um, no, I haven't. Jan, have you seen anything like that? You know, I think I have. Over that way. Oh. Hey, thank you. See you guys. I think I'm gonna get another drink. You want something? Nope, I'm good. All right, I'll be back in a little bit. My family and I are on vacation at Alani, a Disney resort and spa, one of our favorite places to visit. There's no better place to sit back and relax. But as my family would be the first to tell you, that can be hard for me to do. Even on vacation, it seems like I always come across some intriguing aspect of American history yet to be explored. Hi, could I get a Lilikoi, please? Excuse me, do you know what the deal is with these little... Elves up here? You know, those actually aren't elves. They're Menehune. They're mythical little people that have known to inhabited the Hawaiian Islands before the Hawaiians arrived here. Some kids came up and showed me a little interactive game with these elves or Menehune. The game is a Menehune adventure trail for the kids or the family to go learn about the Menehune throughout the resort. Back when the idea of Aulani started, when Disney started this idea, they said, we wanted to tell the true stories of Hawaii. And so they went out and did years of research. And the story of the Menehune was just so intriguing. We realized that it was something we wanted to make sure that our guests got to learn about. So the Menehune, this is mythical legend, right? Well, the Hawaiian culture, you know, it's a complex culture. There was the gods, the ali'i, or the royalty, and then the maka'i nana, the, the common people who worked the land and fished and farmed. And that's always one of the questions. Well, where did the Menehune fit within those classes and where do they fit within the Hawaiian culture? I just want to clarify one thing. You're saying that these Menehune people, they're real? You know, it's interesting. There's myths, there's legends, but there's a lot of physical structures that are attributed to the Menehune. Here in Hawaii? Here in Hawaii, especially on the island of Kauai, but throughout the state. There's over 200 of these Menehune around the resort. I'd be glad to show you around if you want to take a look. Well, you have me intrigued, so I'd love to learn more. This is actually part of the Menehune Adventure Trail, that game that we talked about. So as the story goes, the Menehune were little people, so maybe two or three feet tall. They lived up in the forest, up in the highlands, and they only came out at night, so you never saw them. They probably inhabited these islands before the Hawaiians arrived here. What evidence do we have for this? You look at some of the stories throughout the Pacific Islands and places like Tahiti and the Marquesas have similar stories about an ancient civilization or an ancient people that were called the Manehune. So as you put those things together, you start to see there's some evidence. These myths may be true. So really, you've got a couple of options. One is the Manehune could have been the first people to inhabit Hawaii, or they could be these little people that you've talked about. Maybe it's both. Maybe it's both, and there's one of them hiding in the bushes right there. <laughs> they're hiding everywhere, yeah. right? Yeah, that's why they're here. Todd, I'm a little skeptical. I'm a geologist, so I need some hard evidence. There's a number of these ancient, very unique walls, temples, waterways, and the stories are that those were built by the Menehune. Looking at these stone walls and structures, there's a possibility I could put a timeline on it 
maybe they do go back to the time of these men and who made people. The thing you got to remember also is that the Hawaiian culture was an oral culture. So there is no written history. You have to rely on those oral histories to tell you the truth about the past. For many cultures that have rich and deep oral histories, and they're all based in at least some facts, so I'm willing to go along with that. However, I'm really struggling with this whole Hawaiian hobbit thing. I'll tell you, many Hoonies are not hobbits, but hobbits are real. I've seen them at the University of Hawaii. While on vacation in Hawaii, I stumbled across legends of a tiny race of people once thought to inhabit the Hawaiian Islands. They built large rock structures, and that's something I want to investigate. The Menahune were said to have been about two to three feet tall and to have lived in the forest. Far beyond the stories of these little people is a Hawaiian history steeped in legend and lore. Hawaii, the northernmost outpost of the region known as Polynesia, became a state in 1959. By then, the island's population had already been thriving for hundreds of years. Their society was governed by a monarchy, of which King Kamehameha was the most well-known ruler. The Hawaiian people's legends were passed down over time that spoke of gods, goddesses, and menahune and were similar to legends in other parts of Polynesia. I think that often in legend, there is truth, and I want to know, were these Menahune real? While my family is back at the hotel, I'm headed to find out what the so-called hobbits at the University of Hawaii have to do with this mystery. Hi, Mike Scott Walter. Hi, nice to meet you. So I'm investigating the legends of the Menahune people here in Hawaii. And I was told that you have evidence of little people or hobbits here at the University of Hawaii. Is that true? What we do have here is a cast of one of the so-called hobbits skulls from the island of Flores in Indonesia. And the scientific name for this specimen is uh, Homo floresensis. The term Homo floresiensis refers to an extinct group of people who were just three and a half feet tall. They had big feet, just like the hobbits in Tolkien's famous novels, and have been found only in Indonesia, where their skeletal remains turned up in 2003. The question is, could they have left Indonesia and made it to Hawaii, where they came to be known by another name, the Menahune? That's a small skull. Is, is this a normal skull yes, here? Okay. Right. That's half the size. It's one-third the size. One-third. Right here we have a, a sort of an artistic recreation of one of these uh, Florizensis uh, specimens. And you can see that the arm actually extends quite well down the leg, perhaps Almost below the, the knees. knees. Well, how do we know that this isn't a juvenile or a child? It's <laughs> quite interesting you ask that because uh, the original discoverer, his first impression was that it was, in fact, a child. But if you look at it more closely, compared with that of a six-year-old child, this is a child skull and with baby teeth, two molars, canine, and two incisors. Adult teeth, you can see, are quite different. They have three molars and two premolars, which are completely lacking in the child skull. Mm -hmm. So Florizensis has the typical adult teeth, so no question that this is an adult. Well, so there's no question about it. This yeah. Is very terms, obvious. Right. Okay, so we're talking about Indonesia here. We're talking about a race of small right. people. What would be the most recent time that we know they existed? They were around uh, up until 13 to 12,000 years ago, and then they disappear. 
perhaps a volcanic eruption occurred and that wiped them out. And after that point in time, only anatomically modern humans like ourselves are found in that part of the world. Okay. That same eruption also wiped out quite a few other faunal animal species, including the dwarf elephant species, et cetera, that okay. were also found on this island. Small elephants? Right. Um, is there something going on here with this small group of creatures living on this island environment? What's well, happening there? Well, it's not unprecedented to have uh, dwarfing of species when they're on perhaps a situation, an environment where there's less food, less resources. So the optimum to survive is to get smaller. So we have hobbit people and hobbit elephants? Right. So would we call this human, or is it a different species? Ah, that's a big question, because there are a number of uh, researchers who have looked at this material, and they have suggested that it might be a dwarf species of humans. On the other hand, other people have suggested that it might have suffered from some sort of uh, a disease, uh, which could have been genetic in origin. This is new ground as far as evolutionary studies, is it not? Well, it really does throw a wrench into the uh, whole picture about how evolution was explained up until this time. So this is a pretty controversial skull we're holding, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, extremely controversial. Looking at the little people you're talking about here in Indonesia, is it possible that they may have come from Indonesia here to the Hawaiian Islands? And if so, who would they have encountered and what do you think might have happened? Well, I would say first they'd have to get out of Indonesia. They'd have to have sophisticated technology and navigation skills. Have you found any small bones here in the Hawaiian Islands? Yes, but they belong to children and infants. Uh, certainly, we haven't found any small adult uh, bones. Uh, quite the opposite. Uh, the prehistoric uh, Hawaiians and Polynesians in general were quite tall by uh, even modern day standards. Do you think there could be any truth to the myths and legends of the Menehune people? There could be. Uh, I'll leave open the door for that possibility. Until they find physical evidence, uh, I guess I'm going to have to be a skeptic on this particular point. Yeah. Fair enough. Hi, Jenny. How you doing? Good, good. How's the search for the mythical creatures going? Well, it's going pretty well. I learned that there was an ancient race of little people that lived in Indonesia about 12,000 years ago. Unfortunately, they haven't found any bones or remains of these little people in the Hawaiian Islands. Well, I found something interesting in our guidebook. Apparently, the Menehune were responsible for building a really big waterway on the island of Kauai. It's called the Menehune Ditch. You know what? That must have been one of the sites that Todd talked about. Yes, this. It also says the island census recorded 65 Menahune living on the island in 1820. 65 Menahune on Kauai? Pack your bags. Hawaiian lore tells of an ancient group of little people, just two to three feet tall, who lived in these islands long ago. I found evidence that little hobbit-like creatures really did exist 12,000 years ago in Indonesia. They completely disappeared, which makes me wonder if they came to Hawaii after being wiped out by a giant volcanic eruption. <laughs> Of all the Hawaiian islands, Kauai is the one with the most physical evidence that the Menahune existed. It turns out the top of a massive stone ditch built by the Menahune is still visible. I brought my family along to help me examine it. So how do you know so much about the Menahune? I was working on the Nepali coast, training tour guides, and I ran across stories of the Menahune, and I just decided to find out more. And how did you learn about the ditch here? Well, the ditch is pretty famous. It's the one structure that you can point at and touch and say, the Menahuni built this. 
The Menahuni Ditch is known locally as Kiki Aola. That means Wall of Ola. And Ola was an ali'i, or a king, uh, in early Hawaii. It was built to bring water around the cliff for the people of Ola so that they could irrigate their fields. When was it first documented? The first written record of uh, the ditch was back in 1790s when uh, Captain Cook and his crew were here. And they recorded it as being 24 feet high and quite long. They never did get to the end of it. So the Manahuni built this? That's all we see that's left. Do we know for sure? Are these pieces still original? As far as anyone has been able to tell. OK. These are original. Well, whoever built this, and this is very skilled masonry work, the edges are nice and square. The corners, they're, they're tight joints. They've even notched some of the pieces, like this one right here. So you mean this notch part right here, down here? Yep, there. yep. And this particular type of masonry construction is called dry stacking. They didn't use a mortar to hold the joints together. They just cut it tight enough and perfect so that everything fit together, so it basically became an interlocking single unit. According to the legend, the Menahuni built this in one night. There were thousands of them, and they passed the stones from seven miles away, hand to hand, down the mountain. One night? One night. OK, well, I can certainly appreciate and respect local legends and myths, but if this was 24 feet tall, and all this is hand-cut stone, and it came from seven miles away, I think that's a stretch. When I look at these rocks, and then when I look at the rocks here, these lava flows, that's vesicular basalt. This is vesicular basalt. Why would you carry these stones seven miles hand to hand? And these are huge blocks. I mean, look at these things. They weigh hundreds of pounds a piece. What I'd like to do is take a closer look at the stone itself. Here, Grant, why don't you take some measurements of some of the stones? Jan, do you mind taking some pictures? microscope here. It seems crazy to me that anyone, small or big, would haul huge boulders for miles to build a wall that's made of the same material that appears to be right in front of them. Even though these rocks look the same, I need to know for sure. By examining this rock, I should be able to determine if the rock that's part of this volcanic deposit is the same as the rock used for the wall. Hey, Grant. See the little gas bubbles all peppered through it. Uh -huh. As the lava flows out, it generates these gas bubbles of water vapor and carbon dioxide, and they rise like carbonation does in a glass of pop or beer. Those are vesicles. And when I was looking up here at this rock, it's the same thing. I mean, you can even see them from here, peppered with those little vesicles. It's the exact same rock as this. Hey, Dan, how do you think they got them like cut so square like that? Well, they had to have used tools, and they were very skilled. I don't know if they had metal tools or not, but maybe they forged some metal tools. Based on what we found is that they didn't have metal tools in that day. Uh, they we know used, that for sure. They had rock cutting tools made of rock. That impresses me even more if they're using stone tools. That's a lot of work, but boy, they sure did a good job. I can certainly respect the local legends, the whole seven mile bringing the stone from a quarry there. As a scientist, that just doesn't make sense to me. It makes more sense that the rock is right here. It's the same in the wall as it is here. I got to go with they, they use the local rock. That's what I think. Well, there may be some basis to why the story says that they were carried sit from seven miles away. OK. Because the Manahuni people were the stone masons of the time. Okay. And the quarry, where they worked out of, traditionally, is up at the mountains about seven miles away. So then they it would make sense that they would want to build the wall from the stones from their own quarry. Well, that's possible. And if you look at sacred sites like Stonehenge, for example, the stones used to build it came from tens of miles away. They did it because these were sacred places. So if that's the case, that's interesting, and, and I can appreciate that. What can you tell me about Chief Ola, who commissioned this wall to be built? Well, pretty much doing genealogical studies have established that he lived uh, around 1200 AD, okay. and that he was a real person. 
And he also commissioned other works, not just the wall, but other works in this area. Sydney, in thinking about this legend of the Menahune building this wall at night, a single night, could it mean that they were talking about at night as opposed to one night? It's got to be 90 here today, and it's like this probably almost every day. And so working at night, that might make sense. So maybe that's what it really means. I think you've got a point there. There's probably a good case that could be made. And this idea that they were little people, I'm struggling with that as well, because these blocks, some of them are several hundred pounds apiece, and two to three foot tall people, I don't see them handling them at all like that. There is another theory about that. Minahuni is similar to the, the cross Polynesian term that means lower class. So really what we're talking about is not so much the little people's stature, but their status. Yes. The Tahitians, they think they came over to Hawaii in about 1200 AD, okay. which is about the same time as Chief Ola okay. was doing all of these works in this area. And so it, it kind of fits that they would have applied the name Menahuni to these working people. You know, one of the things that I learned here just the other day was that there was a race of little people that lived in Indonesia that were about three and a half feet tall. But the idea that they would get all the way to the Hawaiian Islands and be the Menahuni people, they haven't found any bones or any other remains that indicate that they did get here. So the idea that it's not a stature thing, but a status thing really does fit together. Are there any other sites where I could possibly see more examples of stonework by the Menahuni people? Well, I'm not sure if it's the Menahuni people, but along the Nepali coast at New Lolokai, there's a lot of stonework there. You might want to check that out. There's no question that the Hawaiian people have a rich history and culture and legends. And I'm not leaving these islands until I get to the truth behind these mythical little people. I stumbled across evidence of an ancient race of little people called the Menahune while on vacation in Hawaii. Legend says the Menahune are responsible for building some of the oldest and most unique rock sites here. And I'm kind of starting to believe it. As the legend goes, they only worked at night, building these massive structures for things like irrigation and fish farming. Their only rule was that no one could watch them work. If anyone saw them working, the Menahune would abandon the site. Whether or not they were small in size or small in terms of class, I'm still not so sure. I'm on my way to the Nepali coast to look for more clues to who these people were. But Hawaiians take their legends seriously. So if I'm going to figure out if there's truth behind this mystery, which is embedded deep in their culture, I'm going to have to immerse myself in it. Hi, I'm Scott Walter. Aloha, Scott. I'm Sabra. I'm Kiao. Oh. Oh, nice Hello. to meet you. I'm here investigating the ancient little people called the Menahune, and I just recently toured the Menahune Ditch. I saw very interesting styles of ancient construction that could possibly be related to these people. So I'd like to learn more about the Polynesians and their work. We'd like to take you out to Nualolokai on the Napali coast. Okay. Nualolokai is a very important cultural mm -hmm. center for the entire island. So we know that it was lived in, that it was a pretty good sized population there. I'm not so sure if they were particularly Menehune. We're still looking into the function, the uses of the place. What we do know is that it's a place of a lot of mana. Mana? What is mana? Mana is that energy that we have inside of us. And then when there's a lot of human activity in a place, it's what we leave behind. This place sounds amazing. 
Should we shove off? Yep. No way. Is that what I think it is? Yes, it is. Is that an X? Normally, when I've studied X carvings in the past, it's been connected to Templar symbolism. Since there is no evidence that the Templars ever made it to the Pacific, this X may mark the spot of something completely different, but also important. Our legends tell us of many migrations to these islands from the South Pacific, and among some of the most famous legends is the legend of Pele. Pele was the goddess of the volcano, the goddess of fire. Well, when Pele landed here, she marked this place with an X. That is our legend. X marks the spot right here. That's it. What I see here is Pele did a wonderful job with the geology, causing two different fractures in this pile of volcanic rock and sediments to fracture in this X form and then fill with lava. And if you look in the middle, you can tell which one came first yeah. and which one came second. The one that goes from the upper left to the lower right came first, mm -hmm. and then the one from the lower left to the upper right came next. Can you just imagine the incredible forces of nature that would have caused that to fracture? And it would be probably earthquakes that caused that fracture mm -hmm. to open up. So maybe Pele was upset about something. Oh. She was always said to have a very fiery nature. This is a great spot, no question. Let's go over this way. I'll show you some of the walls over here. Great. Now, this is not an old historic structure. This this has been restored, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we restored this in 2007. There have been two tsunamis that washed away most of these rocks. And when we came across it, there were only the foundation stones that were there. Most of this was knocked over. Well, this is different than what I saw at the Menahuni Ditch. Mm -hmm. You have multiple rock types here. There are cultural reasons for the mix in rock type. We call this type of stone ala. Mm -hmm. This is called pa'akea. This is a product of the ocean, which is a representation of Kanaloa, the god of the ocean. And then this would be a representation of Kane, who is another god, and he's uh, represented in rock form, basalt rock. Mm -hmm. But what's unique about this here in the Hawaiian Islands is that you don't really see this kind of structure, this type of architecture with the stand-up sandstone that's really reflective of the type of architecture that's done in the South Pacific. Places like around Tahiti, Marquesas, Tuomotu Islands. These are different elements of different cultures from Eastern Polynesia. So they brought that here? That technology. OK. Yes. So how far back do these date? Probably uh, as much as uh, 700 years ago. So my understanding is that the Polynesians arrived in the Hawaiian Islands around 1200 or so AD. Do you think that there were people here when they arrived that go back much further? It's very possible that there could have been. Many of our stories tell about a people who were shorter in stature and arrived earlier. If people brought this rock technology from as far away as Eastern Polynesia, roughly 3,000 miles away, I wonder if the hobbits from Indonesia could have traveled the 6,000 miles from Flores Island to Hawaii. Some of the legends say the Menahune were already here when the first Polynesian voyagers got here, around 1200 AD. Oral histories support that legend. Oral histories also suggest the Menahune were little, but I'm still not sure if they were small in stature or status. 
I recently learned that in the late 1800s, the census for Hawaii, there were a few dozen people who actually claimed to be Menahune. Were the Menahune real? Yes, we have too many stories about the Menahune that describe them in great detail to think otherwise. They had their own ali'i, their own uh, kings, they had their own professionals. The Menahune were a race to themselves. We know about them in much more detail because there is much more engagement between them and us Kanaka from way back when. It seems that around 100 years ago, people started to write about them. And uh, it was that time when Hawaii was becoming really romanticized to the world. And so there are these uh, dreamy characters that were written about who were like fairies that lived in the forest. I think a legend begins with an element of truth in it. And over the years, it's uh, enlarged. But I think there is an element of truth in the belief that there were many huni here in these islands. This is a pretty extensive stone complex. This area has references to ceremonies having to do with dedication of canoes before they get launched out for long voyages. How did they make those trips? What, what well, did they use to navigate? Well, I think in order to understand Polynesian navigation, you need to go to Koho'olawe. Has anyone ever found evidence of the Menahune there? I don't know, but archaeologists have found over 500 sites of cultural importance on that island alone. But I thought that island was off limits. They used it as a bombing target for decades, right? Oh, yes, they did. And there's still many unexploded bombs there on the island and in the ocean. Oh. So you have to be very careful. We may be able to get you on a boat there, but you might have to swim in part of the way. That's OK with me. My family vacation has turned into a quest to uncover the truth behind the legend of the Menahune in Hawaii. I've been given special access to Koho'olawe, a sacred cultural site that for many years was used as a bombing range for the U.S. military. No one has ever looked for evidence of the Menahune there, but if any evidence exists, I want to find it. And I'm going to get there any way I can. When I first heard the legend of the Menahune, a supposed race of tiny people who built things for the Hawaiian elite under the cover of darkness, I thought it sounded far-fetched. But what I've learned on my Hawaiian vacation turned investigation is that the Menahune were real, and that part of the legend is true. I've learned they might be small in size or small in status. Either way, there's no question in my mind they did exist. But I want to know how they got here. And the final clue I need might be on the island of Kaho'olawe. Kaho'olawe has had a long, difficult past. Once a culturally sacred site, years of ranching in the 1800s decimated much of the vegetation on the island. It was used as a bombing test site after Japanese forces attacked Pearl Harbor, launching the United States into World War II. It continued to be a military training site for the next 50 years. Today, many unexploded bombs remain on the island, and in the process of restoring it, people are discovering ancient sites never before seen. So 
So I understand you've done a lot of work with the archaeology here and the cultural studies on the island. I Tell did. me about that. Since 1990, uh, my family was involved with being here with the Protecta of Ohana, who were very passionate about stopping the bombing. And at that time, the bombing wasn't, uh, it, was, it was still going on. Still going on. So the island was bombed since 1939. Oh my God. Do you yeah. remember the bombs? Oh, I, I sure do. I grew up on the island of Maui, and our houses would shake, and our windows would rattle. And at that time, nobody really understood the impact of what was really happening here on this island and its importance to, to our culture. So what makes the island so important, so sacred? This island was the gateway for uh, navigation. Lots of sites here are aligned to the movements of the stars, the moon, and the sun, and this is where navigators would come to to basically uh, learn about that. Uh, we're far enough south that we can see the southern hemisphere stars from this area, and that would train you to be prepared to go down south easily, and then also vice versa to come back up to be able to return here to Hawaii. So in essence, what you're saying is that this island was critical for the ancient navigators. Extremely critical to be able to leave and return. I've learned an awful lot about the Menahune. Most people think of them as hairy little trolls with the round bellies. In our culture, the Menahune come with the migration of Pele, the uh, volcano goddess. Pele brings with her the Menahune, who were given the task to watch over children of gods or children of uh, chiefs, and they actually maintain things. They help to build the older, ancient type of sites that we have here in Hawaii. That's what their function was for us in, in our society. So you can see that it followed that movement of that migration. All the ancient people who traveled to the Hawaiian Islands are said to have come here to Kaho'olawe. And that would mean that the Menahune came here too. It's possible they came from the island of Flores in Indonesia after they were driven out by a volcanic eruption. Flores is where evidence of little people with striking similarities to the Menahune have been found. It's also possible they came from somewhere else. From this island, you can see almost the entire Hawaiian island chain and into the sea far beyond. If the Menahune did come from Indonesia, maybe this is where they landed after being driven out thousands of years ago. Wow, look at these islands. So this is where they brought the navigators to teach them about long range navigation, is that correct? And if you look across the vista here, we can see all of the major peaks that are very important for those who are navigating from the south up back to Hawaii. This is the spot that you'd want to be. From this spot, you can see Lanai, Molokai, Maui, the big island of Hawaii, and on a very clear day, even the island of Oahu. Just off the coast, you can also see what is known as the Road to Tahiti, an oceanic channel that ancient Polynesian voyagers used to travel from Tahiti to Hawaii and back. Well, this is amazing. Tell me about this place. This is our bell stone. It's got iron in it. And if you bang it on the end there, there's actually a sound. You would use it to call. This would right. be an ancient cell phone that you would use to dial into whomever it was that you were calling to do your ceremony. So did the Menahune come here? And if they did, did they use the island also for navigation and observation? As of today, there's really no stories that talk about that here. We've got lots of research to do. It's not saying that it doesn't exist. It still may be out there and we still need to find information. One thing I've learned in all my investigations is that the absence of evidence doesn't mean that evidence doesn't exist. It just means it hasn't been found yet. While I'm not ready to say the Menahune were three and a half feet tall, were members of a Hawaiian lower class or descendants of the so-called hobbits from Indonesia, I am ready to say they were real. The Menahune are part of too many stories and connected to too many sites to think otherwise. 
I think it's just a matter of time before hard evidence turns up, offering more clues about who the Menahune really were. These ancient long range trips across the ocean, they really happened, and they happened regularly. Regularly right? and repeatedly, more than once. Well, it is incredible, and I think I have a better understanding of these Menahune people. They are part of our history, and we descend from that history. The legends that we have is the information that we need to restore some of the ancient knowledge. And as we do that, we can understand my ancestors a lot better and how they saw the world around them. What you have shown me here today convinces me that an ancient race of people like the Menahune could have made it here to the Hawaiian Islands thousands of years ago. Our Hawaiian vacation, which started with fruity drinks on the beach, turned out to be a lesson into the power of legend. The ancient Polynesians used oral stories to record their amazing history, and the Menahune were part of that history. There's no proof the so-called hobbits from Indonesia traveled here and became the Menahune, but the fact that such a small race of people existed there proves it's possible a small race of people could have lived here, too. I think the Menahune were part of a united group of oceanic voyagers who laid the foundation for what the Hawaiian culture is today. Their story confirms that there is always some truth in legend. All of Polynesia is filled with stories of amazing people navigating their way toward new discoveries that we're just beginning to understand. that we were all taught growing up is wrong. My name is Scott Walter, and I'm a forensic geologist. There's a hidden history in this country that nobody knows about. There are pyramids here, chambers, tombs, inscriptions. They're all over this country. We're gonna investigate these artifacts and sites, and we're gonna get to the truth. Sometimes history isn't what we've been told. here in Washington, D.C. I found something incredible. It's really going to blow your mind. As you know, I've been studying the place for a while, but now I've found symbolism associated with the people who built this place that is just incredible. This is evidence of something really huge, Scott. Get here as quick as you can. 
I'm in Washington, D.C., following up on a cryptic call from my old buddy, Alan Butler. He says there are secret symbols hidden in the design of D.C. And if there are, I want to see them for myself. D.C., or the District of Columbia, has been the seat of power for the president since 1790. The National Mall runs through the center of the city and includes the U.S. Capitol, the Washington Monument, the Lincoln Memorial, and the White House. I'm meeting Alan on the steps of the Capitol building to learn more about the architects who designed this city and about their allegedly mysterious motives. Alan, how you doing? I'm fine, man, are you? I'm doing fine. Ah, oh, boy, have I got something to show you. You do? I tell you what, that phone call was very cryptic, and you definitely got my attention, so do tell. Well, I've discovered that this whole city of Washington is filled with symbols left here by a secret society. Do you happen to have a map of Washington with you? I brought one with me. Let's go over here. Well, what I'm going to do first is I'm going to put some dots on here on some of the major intersections in Washington, D.C. There's four there, and the most important one goes right in the center of the ellipse. We're going to join those two lines together. We're going to put another line down there to the ellipse. We're going to have a third one there to the ellipse. And then we're going to have another one there. Now, what do you see, Scott? Well, I'll tell you what I see is I see two Vs. It's an ancient symbol of the sacred feminine or the goddess. Many have speculated about the significance of the shapes that can be created when connecting important landmarks throughout the city. For example, a five-pointed star, symbolic of both Venus's orbit in the sky and of the goddess Venus herself, connects the White House, DuPont Circle, Mount Vernon Square, Washington Circle, and Logan Circle. Connected another way, they form two Vs, which is also a goddess symbol known as a chevron. Goddess worship, or worship of female deities, was practiced by many ancient cultures, including the Romans, Greeks, and Egyptians. Alan thinks it's no coincidence stars and Vs are found here, though I need a little more evidence to convince me. What really interested me when this cropped up was not just that the chevrons were there, but the actual length of them. Each of them measures 366 megalithic yards. Megalithic yards? Yeah. I've yeah. never heard of that before. What's a megalithic yard? The megalithic yard is an ancient unit of linear measurement. It was rediscovered by a Scottish engineer called Alexander Tom. He measured over 600 of the most famous monuments in Britain and France, like, you know, places like Stonehenge. Understanding the megalithic yard is critical to Allen's theory. Allen believes that the megalithic yard, which is equivalent to 2.72 feet and is often used in units of 366, was used to design structures like Stonehenge over 3,000 years ago. This was the same time ancient cultures were practicing goddess worship. If we can prove that the megalithic yard was also used in DC, it could mean that the architects of our nation's capital were also familiar with goddess worship. Like we might use the foot or the meter, they were using a unit which was 2.7 feet in length and he christened it the megalithic yard. We have it here in Washington, D.C.? I know, it's incredible. These units of 366 megalithic yards are all over the city. There are dozens of examples. And although it's incredible, it's true. OK, I have another question for you. 366, does this have anything to do with the number of days of the year? Is it connected that way somehow? Yes, it is. The year that was used by the people who built Stonehenge and the other monuments was 366 days in length. So these units of measurement also related to a measurement of time. But I can show you something else which is really going to blow your mind. Hmm. Do you fancy a pint? Now you're talking my language. Let's go. 
Allen believes the discovery of the megalithic yard in Washington, D.C. is a big deal. This is because the use of the megalithic yard here would suggest the designers of D.C. were influenced by the same ancient beliefs as the builders of prehistoric monuments like Stonehenge. I think it's possible the designers of D.C. were hiding clues to their own beliefs. Well, Alan, I like this experiment already. Well, I can't think of a better place to carry out an experiment, can you? <laughs> All right, so what's the plan here? OK, what I'm going to do with this beer is prove to you that the megalithic yard and its components is still alive and well right here in the United States. This cube has sides which measure exactly one-tenth of a megalithic yard. What I want you to do is to pour that pint into that cube. And if oh. I'm correct, it will fill that cube absolutely to the top, proving that the pint is a megalithic unit. Alan's experiment has proven to me that the megalithic yard is not only a real measurement, but also that this 3,000-year-old unit still has relevance and is with us today. Well, I tell you what, Alan, that was pretty impressive. And as far as the megalithic yard existing in ancient times, I'll buy it, OK? But what does that got to do with Washington, D.C.? And what does it have to do with goddess worship? We all know that the megalithic yard is an extremely ancient unit. It goes back in Britain to at least 3,500 B.C. The woman within society at that time was seen as being something very special because she had the power to create life just the same as nature has the power to produce crops and fruits and animals and all the rest of the things that human beings need. I can appreciate that. I mean, if we go back far enough, they didn't understand procreation, so all of a sudden this female is, is giving life. That would have been mysterious, and I can see why they would look upon women with reverence. So, hence goddess worship, right? Absolutely. Many ancient cultures and some secret societies may have practiced goddess worship and represented it through the use of symbols, like the V's I saw earlier on the map. Allen believes that the same people who revered the goddesses used an ancient unit of measure called the megalithic yard. The discovery of both in DC suggests to me that goddess worship could have been going on here as well. Why is it that it has to be veiled? Why all the secrecy? Why embedding it within Washington, D.C.? The goddess-worshipping people were very much marginalized. We tended to end up with a much more patriarchal sort of religion. Mm -hmm. And when that happened, the people who were the most devout of the goddess-worshippers, they had to find somewhere to go so that they could maintain their beliefs without being persecuted. So I think to a great extent, it was driven underground. And so you're saying it survived in part due to the megalithic yard? Um, I think the two probably survived hand in hand. The people who used the megalithic yard, it was part of their pact, their mm -hmm. secret, mm -hmm. their pact with the goddess. And it became just as secret as the goddess herself was secret. So, Alan, do you really think that there are symbols and signs of goddess worship embedded in Washington, D.C.? Oh, absolutely, Scott. Have you got the map that we were using earlier? Yep. Right here. So look, Scott. Yeah. Um, the double chevron. The chevron has always been associated with female sexuality. That's right. It's the pubic triangle, the symbol where life comes from. A very ancient symbol that's been around probably forever. And it's not the only symbol we can associate with the goddess that we might find in and around Washington, D.C. There may be cases of other chevrons, and perhaps most significantly, we might find diamonds. Diamonds, okay, the diamond, that's very important. The diamond shape has represented many things throughout history, and it is still used today. In esoteric circles, it serves as a symbol of the birth canal. The diamond shape is also used to celebrate the female as the life giver which is a basic principle of goddess worship. You know, the District of Columbia is in the shape of a diamond. It's 10 miles by 10 miles by 10 miles by 10 miles, 100 square miles that are marked by 40 boundary stones around that perimeter. There's your goddess symbol again. And I tell you what, I need to go take a look at one of these boundary stones. I think it will connect the Founding Fathers with goddess worship. 
Do you realize what you're suggesting? I mean, this is, this is pretty provocative. In fact, when people hear about this, they're gonna go, no way. But if you have measurements, the megalithic yard, and it exists here, and you can show and demonstrate it enough, you might be able to convince people, and that would be borderline explosive. I'm here in Washington, D.C., investigating whether the monuments and buildings lining the city streets are part of one big secret. My historian friend, Alan Butler, has a controversial but potentially groundbreaking theory. He says the architects of our nation's capital used a long-lost unit of measure called the megalithic yard to plan the city's design, a unit of measure he believes was used by ancient people who practice goddess worship. Alan and I believe there's a reason these goddess symbols are here in D.C. But first, I need to understand who helped establish the D.C. location as our capital and why. Fergus, I'm investigating a theory that involves the boundary stones that outline Washington, D.C. But the first thing I'd like to know from you is how did D.C. get to where it is geographically? Well, imagine we're back in 1789. The Constitution has just been signed. There's a consensus that the country needs a permanent capital. The capital's been wandering from town to town for 10 years. That permanent capital would be a physical symbol of unity for these 13 fractious states that comprise the United States. But when plans for our nation's capital started to take shape in 1790, many cities were fiercely vying to be chosen. There were more than 30 locations under consideration, including Newport, Rhode Island, Williamsburg, Virginia, and Annapolis, Maryland. Each city made their case, but a backroom deal led to Maryland and Virginia donating land for DC's construction as part of the Residence Act. So Fergus, why would they pick Washington DC? Wasn't it all swamp land back then? Well, actually it was pretty good land. It was pasture land. It was never really a swamp at all. Plenty of rolling hills here in the district. As a matter of fact, Capitol Hill, the Capitol is on a hill. The notion that it was a swamp was propaganda. It was propaganda launched by other parts of the country that wanted the capital for themselves by denigrating the Potomac. Another thing that strikes me as very curious is when you look at the shape, and, and I understand that we're talking about 100 square miles, the layout, 40 stones that make up this, what I see is a diamond shape. Congress mandated that the federal district, as it was called, would be a square. Why does it look like a diamond? Because George Washington stretched it so that the one corner of this square would incorporate the city of Alexandria, where he owned property. I see. This is one of the original boundary markers. The first boundary stone was laid in April, 1791. Over the next two years, 40 boundary stones were laid to mark the diamond-shaped 100 square mile area that President Washington had chosen for the city. 36 of these 200-year-old stones have survived to this day, making them the oldest federally placed monuments in the United States. Well, I tell you what, it's in pretty good shape. I mean, it suffered little wear and tear, but uh, it does feel like sandstone. I think it's called the Aquia Sandstone. And my understanding is there's a number of buildings in the capital city that are made with the sandstone, including the White House. And the Capitol building itself. The Capitol itself, OK. Well, you can still see the inscription. And on the side there, I think it's uh, 1792. The first stone was placed at Jones Point on the Virginia side of the river in a Masonic ceremony. George Washington was present. And quite a few other prominent members of the community. I know that George Washington, like many of our founding fathers, was a Freemason. Fergus said Washington was the one who altered the plan to include Alexandria and make the boundary stones into a diamond. Maybe he had a secret reason for that. 
along with some of the greatest ancient civilizations, like the Romans and the Egyptians. The Freemasons may also have been secret practitioners of goddess worship. And if a Mason created a diamond symbol with boundary stones like this one, other symbols might be hidden here too. So how about the street system now? That's a whole nother thing that many researchers have pondered over to this day. Well, for that, Washington picked uh, Pierre Charles L'Enfant, a remarkable Frenchman who had served uh, heroically with Washington in the Revolution. Pierre L'Enfant was a brilliant architect. He was trained as an engineer. He was a man with a mathematical head. He was admired deeply by Washington and other founders. On the other hand, he was a pain in the neck. <laughs> he couldn't get along with anybody. Even Washington, who adored him, was so irritated by the man, he fired him. Interesting. OK, so you've seen the layout of the city, obviously. And it is a series of angles and geometric shapes. Have you ever heard of the concept of sacred geometry? I've heard of the concept, OK. This is one of the main tenets of Freemasonry. And we know George Washington was a Freemason. Our understanding is L'Enfant was a Freemason. And I think there's pretty strong evidence to suggest that this whole concept of sacred geometry is part of what inspired L'Enfant in the layout of the city. What do you think about that? I don't agree with it at all. Okay. I don't think there's any major historians of the early federal period or of early Washington who would uh, agree with that. And as far as any Masonic connections or symbolism associated with masonry that was incorporated into the design of the city, your thoughts on that? I don't think it exists. You don't think so? No. OK. Well, I disagree. I respectfully disagree. In fact, I think it's obvious. And on one level, when you look at the geometry of the city, I believe the diamond shape itself of the District of Columbia is where it all starts, and that's just the beginning. I think it is related directly to masonry. I think the founding fathers, George Washington, absolutely for sure was involved in laying down these secret symbols and signs within the city, and that's what I'm investigating. Part of what I'm looking into is something I believe the Founding Fathers embraced and that all Masons embraced. It's something called goddess worship. And I also believe that our Founding Fathers and people in Washington right up to this day had a secret agenda hiding something important, perhaps a religious ideology that we're not aware of that's embedded within Washington, D.C. There may be clues that Washington, D.C., our nation's capital, could in fact be a city dedicated to goddess worship. Female shapes and symbols suggesting it's the city of the goddess might have secretly been included in the city's design. Many of the designers of D.C. were Freemasons, a secret society that I believe may have revered women as goddesses. Their use of symbols here together with their use of what may be an ancient unit of measure called the megalithic yard, could have been important. And I'm just starting to understand how important. While I checked out the diamond-shaped perimeter of the city, my friend Alan was working to find some more clues hidden in plain sight here at the Washington Monument. How's it going for you? Well, it's a little bit difficult, as you can see, because of all the work that's going on here at the monument. Yeah. Uh, but generally speaking, the measurements are holding up quite as I expected. Really? Yeah. But we haven't finished. Do you want to help me go on measuring? Absolutely. Let's go. So what we need to do, Scott, is get to the very end of this ellipse. OK. And then take a measurement to the base of the monument. I'm going to start by drawing an ellipse. Right. So then what we have is we have another ellipse. That's it. Right? And then we have a second ellipse. Yeah. And then we have the Washington Monument right here, correct? Yeah. I need to take a measurement from here yeah. to the edge of the monument. About 173 megalithic yards. 
So, and I can tell you that the monument has a base of 55.125 feet. And how many megalithic yards? 20.25. I also would like to use the measuring wheel and do the whole circumference of the circle just to make sure we've got it absolutely OK. Right. Architect Pierre L'Enfant, the man behind DC's street layout, decided to put the Washington Monument on the mall. Construction didn't begin until 1848. That's when the cornerstone was laid in a Masonic dedication ceremony. Completed after the Civil War, it's the tallest stone obelisk in the world at 555 feet. There's one particular thing about this area that I've noticed, and I managed to get a picture which will illustrate it really well. So as you can see, this is the outer ellipse. Now the distance from that point of the ellipse, the widest part, to that point of the ellipse is exactly 366 megalithic yards. Exactly? Yeah. That's incredible. Absolutely. 366 is the number of megalithic yards found throughout the city. Like the Chevron Allen showed me, it could be a throwback to when ancient people used a 366-day calendar year. It has to be more evidence the people who designed this were using the measurement intentionally. How come nobody knows about this? I don't know. I guess, I guess it's because they don't know what they're looking for. I mean, would you look for a 5,000-year-old measurement in a 300-year-old city. And you, you wouldn't even know about it to look for it. But what I really want to ask you, Scott, is what do you see in the center of this picture? What we have here is two ellipses, but oftentimes you'll have two circles. Sometimes will be symbolic of male and female. And when you push those two circles together, you create a vertical almond shape. This is called sacred geometry in esoteric circles, but that vertical almond shape that you create is something called the vesica pisces. Vesica pisces is the name of the shape created when two circles intersect and overlap to form an oval. The term comes from the Latin phrase that means bladder of a fish. A similar shape is seen in religious symbols, such as the Christian fish symbol. Most importantly, Allen's research suggests the shape is sometimes used by Freemasons and can even be seen as symbolic of female genitalia. It's an ancient representation of the female vagina. And but... here again, this gets into this thesis you have of goddess ideology or goddess worship being embedded into the city of Washington, D.C. Absolutely. And, and look at the symbolism, Scott. We have a huge phallic representation mm -hmm. in the goddess representation of the vagina. That is the union of heaven and earth, as well as the union of the god and the goddess. And so what this represents is this concept we've talked about many times, symbols and signs hidden in plain sight. Absolutely. Well, you've demonstrated that the megalithic yard measurement is used here in Washington, D.C., and specifically at the Washington Monument. I was thinking about the whole layout of Washington, D.C. We're talking about this information of the megalithic yard and the goddess ideology being kept in secret. Well, take a look at this. I was looking at the boundary stones, the diamond with the 40 boundary stones of the District of Columbia. It just struck me that there's a symbol that appears to tie the Freemasons to everything that we're doing here in Washington, D.C. Take a look at that. What do you see there? The square and compass. The square and compass. You know what, Alan? This compass in the square in the shape of a diamond, I mean, it's fundamental, it's obvious. It's an exact replication of the diamond that encircles Washington, D.C. This is the connection, I think, that absolutely ties it to nobody else but the Freemasons. And don't forget, Scott, that that diamond going around Washington, D.C. is the District of Columbia. Who is Columbia? The goddess. The goddess. Most people think of the name District of Columbia as a reference to explorer Christopher Columbus. However, Columbia was also the name of a pagan goddess who was a symbol of liberty. 
female personification of liberty can be seen all across America, from the Statue of Liberty in New York to the Statue of the Goddess atop the Capitol Dome and even in the logo of the Hollywood studio, Columbia Pictures. Alan, I don't think there's any question about it at this point that the only people who could be behind these secret symbols that lay out this goddess worship in Washington, D.C. has to be the Freemasons. I agree. So at this point, what I feel I need to do is I've got to talk to a Freemason that, that might know something about this. That's the only way to get to the bottom of it. So that's what I'm going to do next. I'm at the Scottish Rite Masonic Temple. The Scottish Rite is a branch of Freemasons said to have special hidden knowledge. From the real assassins of Abraham Lincoln to the true meaning of the symbols in DC. I'm looking into the mysterious design of Washington, DC. There is no question that in the city of Washington, many symbols exist and have to do with Freemasonry. What I'd like to know is, did the Founding Fathers embed these symbols within the city that indicate goddess worship? In DC, everywhere you look, you find goddess statues and goddess symbols. The architects of our nation's capital might have been hiding a big secret amongst its streets and monuments. For those who had the eyes to see. There's one man who knows more than most about Freemasons and their motivation behind the use of symbols to represent their ideas and beliefs. If anyone knows whether Masons were hiding secret symbols of goddess worship in DC, it's Akram Elias. Akram, I recently talked to a historian of the city who absolutely denied a connection between Freemasonry and the symbols that I saw here that clearly indicate the handprint of Freemasons. Are these symbols the work of Freemasons or not in Washington, DC? There is no question that in the city of Washington, many symbols exist and have to do with Freemasonry. The language of symbolism was paramount, was essential to the enterprise from the beginning. Now, interestingly enough, every major architect who worked on the city's design and architecture, starting with Pierre L'Enfant, the architect who worked on, on the White House, the United States Capitol, happened to be Freemasons. It makes sense to see Masonic symbolism in almost every one of those symbols in the city. But that does not mean, however, that these architects came together as a group and conspired, as some of the conspiracy theorists talk about. So what you're saying is, is there's not necessarily a grand plan that they all got together and said, okay, here's what we're gonna do. However, because they had the same basic training in Freemasonry, a lot of these concepts and ideas are inherent, so they're naturally going to come out. Is that what you're saying? Correct. I want to tell you a little bit about some of the research that I've done with Alan Butler. He has documented to my satisfaction that the Founding Fathers incorporated a unit of measure, something called the megalithic yard, that he has documented pretty much all over the city that he believes goes back thousands of years. So the question is, is there a secret system of measure that was incorporated into the design of the city by the Freemasons? Numbers are essential in the language of Freemasonry. Uh, in fact, they are essential to the natural order of this universe. It is no coincidence that even in the Bible, you have a book on numbers. 
And the most important thing in the city that I would say, geometry. At the heart of the design of Washington, D.C. is geometry. Now, interestingly enough, geometry is feminine. It is now, feminine. It is feminine. In Freemasonry, we speak of the deity, whatever that supreme intelligence is, as the grand architect or the grand geometrician. This is where the letter G is used in. Between the compass and the, the square. square compass and compass. So okay. it's geometry. The square and compass is both a measurement tool and one of the most recognizable symbols of the Freemasons. The square is said to symbolize integrity and maybe where we get the phrase fair and square. The compass represents an initiate's journey of understanding as he moves through the different levels of Freemasonry. The G at the center is connected to geometry, a female concept, and another possible link to the sacred feminine. Are Freemasons goddess worshipers? For Freemasonry to worship anything or to tell people to worship anything, that goes against the essence of Freemasonry. However, in the teachings of Freemasonry, the duality, the balance, the equilibrium between the feminine and the masculine are at the core. Some researchers suggest that the feminine seems to be emphasized through symbols and signs within Washington, D.C. Freedom is a feminine concept. This city is dedicated to the feminine, that is freedom. Freedom is represented by the feminine, not by coincidence. Having the feminine as well as the masculine represented through symbols in the city of Washington makes sense because Washington, D.C.'s hidden symbols and mysteries in its architecture and design reflect an idea, and that is that there is feminine and masculine. Okay, I think I get it now. And after everything that I've seen so far in this city, these Freemasons, by and large, they incorporated feminine symbols and that duality of male, female, heaven and earth, good, bad, light, dark, back into balance. America is much more than a land, much more than a country, much more than a people. It is an idea. And that idea is liberty, freedom. Hello? Scott, I've been taking these measurements, and what I've discovered will blow your mind. I found more evidence of the use of the megalithic measurement here in DC, but I've also found an amazing connection that links to an ancient site in England that was built over 3,000 years ago. Where? The Pentagon. What? Could the architects of Washington, D.C. have designed this city as a temple for goddess worship? A spiritual practice linking many of the world's most advanced ancient civilizations represented in secret symbols? That's what I'm trying to find out. Everything I've seen so far leads me to believe the symbols hidden in the city's layout are important in proving that theory. And there's one more place I need to check out, the Pentagon, a place that's significant to me. As a forensic geologist, I was part of the team that examined the fire damaged concrete after the attack here on 9-11. All right, Alan, <laughs> you've piqued my interest more than a little bit. We're here at the Pentagon, a place where I spent time after 9-11 working on this building, so it's very meaningful to me. Hijacked American Airlines Flight 77 crashed into the Pentagon on September 11, 2001. As a forensic geologist, I was called to examine structural damage after the terrorist attack. Later, I learned what a significant date 9-11 was for the Pentagon. The attack came exactly 60 years to the day after construction began on the new headquarters of the U.S. Department of Defense. 
several locations were considered, but President Franklin Delano Roosevelt himself finally selected the site. And I wonder why he chose that location. The reason that I brought you here is because the Pentagon specifically associates with a place in my own homeland back in England. I'd like to show you a couple of photographs, if I may. This is a place where oh. you've been, Scott. <laughs> Stonehenge. Exactly. This is at least 5,000 years old, has a circular henge, yep. and then a smaller circle of stones. Yep. And are you going to tell me there's a connection here with the Pentagon? There absolutely is. All pentagons have to be designed within a circle. And the circle around the Pentagon is exactly five times the size of the henge at Stonehenge. What Alan appears to have discovered could be earth-shattering. It could mean that the headquarters of our nation's military was designed with ancient principles of another goddess-worshipping group of people. Stonehenge is a place that may have been constructed using the megalithic yard. That's the same ancient measurement that Alan and I believe we found in DC and that may link to ancient goddess worshiping cultures. Wasn't it President FDR who made the final decision of where the Pentagon was gonna be located? It certainly was. And he also had something to say about its overall design. It was intended to be further over originally and right. nearer to the city. On the very last day before construction began, he pulled rank as Supreme Commander of the Armed Forces and said, no, I don't want it there. I want it on this site of the old Hoover Airport. And by the way, FDR was a Freemason, was he not? 33 degree. 33rd degree Freemason. OK, the question then becomes, why did he want to move it here? Why here? I think the reason that he wanted to do it was because it was sending a message to other Freemasons. In doing this, in putting the Pentagon here, he created a megalithic triangle which led from the Capitol to the Pentagon, from the Pentagon to the center of the ellipse, and from the ellipse back to the Capitol. And that triangle was 33 times 366 megalithic yards in length. And of course, he was a 33rd degree Freemason. The number 33 is significant to the Freemasons. The number 366 may have been significant to ancient people like the ones who built Stonehenge. It used to be the length of the year. The triangle can be seen as yet another symbol of the female, the goddess. The fact that we have a megalithic triangle incorporating both of these numbers here in DC, linking America's most significant structures, in my view, is no coincidence. I think it could be further evidence that the Freemasons, who had a role in building our nation's capital, we're replicating the architectural practices of ancient cultures, ancient cultures that were likely involved in goddess worship. Alan, this is incredible. This has to indicate that they had to have used the megalithic system, does it not? I think that's absolutely the case. And when we look back, we see with Stonehenge, 4,000 years ago, they're using the megalithic yard. The plan of Washington, D.C. is laid out and the megalithic yard is already inherent in that plan. After that, we have the Pentagon, which again is using the megalithic yard. Alan, you continually amaze me. This discovery of the megalithic yard is incredible. Quite clearly, FDR knew that it was inevitable that the USA would be drawn into the Second World War. That's why the Pentagon was built. He must have looked out many times from up here and seeing the statue on top of the Capitol, which after all is the goddess, but it's the goddess in the guise of armed freedom. We've seen goddess symbols all over the city. I think in part it was due to a veneration of the sacred feminine. The goddess is a symbol of freedom, which is one of the messages our founding fathers was trying to send. Everything I've seen suggests to me that Washington, D.C. could be the city of the goddess. I believe that there are indications that the megalithic yard could have been used to lay out America's capital, and that it may have been used in the past by societies that revered a female goddess above or on par with a male god. I think the builders of D.C., many of whom were Freemasons, may have revered a goddess as well. 
this 5,000-year-old unit of measure may have been used hand-in-hand -hand with a reverence for the feminine that was a sacred part of the ancient world. And I think that both the megalithic yard and the reverence for the goddess were passed on through time by secret societies such as the Freemasons. It's just one more example of our connection to the past in ways we're just starting to understand. history that we were all taught growing up is wrong. My name is Scott Walter, and I'm a forensic geologist. There's a hidden history in this country that nobody knows about. There are pyramids here, chambers, tombs, inscriptions. They're all over this country. We're going to investigate these artifacts and sites, and we're going to get to the truth. Sometimes history isn't what we've been told. I recently received a message from a guy in Lake Mills, Wisconsin. He says there's strange stuff going on beneath the surface of one of the local lakes. Hey, Scott, this is uh, Jeff in Wisconsin. Hey, there's a mystery here that I think that you really need to check out. Some people are saying that there's pyramids under the water of Rock Lake. You know, they think that the Aztecs may have built them, and I want to know what you think. This is something I've got to see for myself. I'm on my way to meet Jeff now. Jeff. Hey, Scott. How you doing? You got me a beer already, huh? Yeah, of course. All right. Let's see what we got here. Stone teepee, and it looks like, are those three pyramids? Yes, they are. Does this have anything to do with why you called me? This is exactly why I called you. We're meeting at a place called Tyranina Brewing Company. It's named after Tyranina, the old name for Rock Lake. This area is steeped in legend. Locals tell stories of a foreign tribe which long ago built stone structures and effigy mounds near the lake that are supposedly now underwater. All of this where we're at now and, and the beer all in ties into why I asked you to come here. Okay. It has to deal with some underwater pyramids here in Lake Mills. How, how did this whole story start? Well, uh, it all started in 1900 when some duck hunters found the pyramids underwater. They were out paddling their boat and he stuck an oar down and hit, hit some rocks. Maybe it's just a pile of rocks. It could be just a pile of rocks, but that's it's not the legend around here. Can somebody go down and take a look at it? A few years later, some uh, scuba divers went down to check it out. OK, and they saw these pyramids. These pyramids in the water. Well, what do they look like? Well, here, I got a diagram to show you. This is a local diver gave okay. this to me. Well, look at that. And there's supposedly supposed to be three of them. Those are pretty big if this diver and the scales, right? Kind of a long-shaped pyramid, right? Yeah. How, how deep is this? It's roughly in about 20 feet of water. They used to protrude out of the water, though, until the water level rose. 
The, the rumor is around here that the Aztecs might have made them. The Aztecs, yeah. up here in Wisconsin? Yeah, that's, that's the rumor. That's the rumor, okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, I know a little bit about the Aztecs. The Aztecs emerged in central Mexico in the early 1300s. They conquered their neighbors and became an empire known for huge markets and pyramids. They built their capital, Tenochtitlan, where Mexico City now stands. Early Spanish visitors reported that Tenochtitlan was five times the size of London. They eventually engineered and built this amazing city, this huge city that had walls that apparently separated the different classes. The elite were on one side and the common people were on another. We're talking about a pretty advanced culture, but coming up here to Wisconsin, that's pretty incredible. Yeah. I'm looking at your beer here, Rocky's Revenge. Well, Rocky's Revenge is one of the many legends, and this is one of the legends here, the protector of the pyramids. Is that a dinosaur? Yeah, it's kind of like the Loch Ness. OK. Wisconsin's uh, version of Nessie? Yeah. But do people really believe there's something there? Actually, the, the local scuba divers do. They, uh, they, have, they feel like someone's watching them when they dive underwater, and they have like a, a fear of, of you know, just being under there. Really? And you know, a lot of them are, get like a, a, a scared feeling while they're down there. Well, I'm not going to get creeped out by uh, murky water or a uh, rock lake monster. In fact, I want to get to the bottom of this mystery. And the only way to do that is to get to the bottom of the lake. Are you going to scuba dive down? Nope. Submarine. Wisconsin checking out a local legend. More than a hundred years ago, a couple duck hunters were rowing in Rock Lake. The story goes that they put down a paddle and hit something hard, maybe an underwater pyramid. That's bizarre, but what's even stranger is who the locals think are responsible. The Aztecs, they're the empire that dominated Mexico for 300 years, starting in 1300 AD. The idea that the Aztecs traveled to Wisconsin to build pyramids is pretty bizarre. But the story gets stranger still. According to legend, there's a mythical beast named Rockford in the lake. Divers report feeling uneasy when they're underwater, as though they're being watched. I'm not really buying the idea of Wisconsin's own Loch Ness Monster. Still, I want to see what's down there, and I'm going to do it using a one-man submarine. Hey guys, really excited to check out the Fuga sub here. I, uh, I've heard a lot about them and I'm anxious to give it a try today. Looks like we've got good calm water out there and from the dock it looks pretty clear. So you guys realize that there are people that believe that the Aztecs built pyramids that are in the bottom of the lake and obviously the subs will help us see if that's true or not, but have you heard anything about that? Yes, actually, we're really quite excited about diving out here. We've wanted to go out here for several years. I'm not certain who built these things, but um, they're certainly worth taking a look at. Well, I appreciate you guys being willing to help out today. And I, uh, I see these are yellow submarines. Never been a big Beatles guy. I'm more of a Rolling Stones guy. But uh, wh why the yellow color? It's a high visibility color, and one good reason for making them yellow is there, there's a lot of boats driving around, and you just don't want someone to come and mow you down. OK. Also, for underwater filming, we found that the, the yellow is the best color in the spectrum to pick up on film. And Fugu Sub, why, why that name? Well, Fugu is a Japanese word for pufferfish. The pufferfish moves adeptly underwater. That's why the guys named their subs after it. You drive one thruster forward and reverse the other, you'll turn on a dime. Yeah, we brought a video along so you could possibly yeah. take a look at it and see, you know, get an idea of what it uh, can do. Sure, you know, let's take a look. You can okay. see us on the surface there, and uh, you'll see some underwater shots in a minute. There you are at the surface. Yep. It kind of operates like a boat there. Yeah, we designed it that way, and these can go on basically any boat ramp that you can yeah, find. It's ideal for a lake like this to launch it and go. Yeah. It's, uh, okay. 
So how deep can you go in these? We can take these to 100 feet, and uh, we've designed these so that they can only ascend and descend quite slowly. Okay. So you're not going to have to deal with any uh, decompression Pression issues. issues. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm ready to go. What do you say we get these things in the water? First, we've got to do a bit of prep work on them. All right, guys. I'll okay. be back in a little bit. While the Fuga subs are being prepped, I'm going to talk to a guy named Roberto Rodriguez. He studied the Aztecs. Maybe he'll be able to tell me if there's any truth to the rumor that the Aztecs built settlements in Wisconsin. Hey, Roberto. Hey, how you doing? Nice to meet you. Great to meet you. Well, I understand you're an expert on the Aztecs, but uh, why are we meeting here in a cornfield? Well, I was looking for where the Aztecs had come from. But halfway through my research, I began to interview many elders. And most Native American elders? Yes, yes. OK. And most of them told me that if I was looking for that idea of origins, to follow the corn. Follow the corn. Follow the corn. Follow the maize. See, corn, it's probably the only crop in the history of humanity that documents itself. It was created literally about 7,000 years ago in southern Mexico. Created? See, the thing about corn is that it has to be planted, cultivated, and harvested by human beings because it can't grow by itself. Scientists today believe that corn came to what is today the U.S. perhaps between four to 6,000 years ago. OK. How does this tie in with the Aztecs? They're a corn-based society, so that was their life. Corn was the most sacred crop to the Aztecs. While they worshiped many gods, the two most important were the corn god and corn goddess. The Aztecs routinely sacrificed humans and animals to please them and to guarantee a good harvest. Sometimes, they even ate parts of the victims' bodies. Does that mean that the Aztecs brought corn into what is now North America? Well, the Aztecs uh, were a corn-based society, mm -hmm. but they're not the ones that brought it here. The corn is many, many thousands of years prior to the Aztecs. Right, OK. Indigenous peoples brought it here, native peoples, American Indians from the south. It's everywhere for thousands of years. So it starts in southern Mexico, and it and went And then it spread every, out after that. Everywhere. So uh, Canada, Peru, you know, the Andes, everywhere, including here. By pursuing the story of the Aztecs, that's what led me to the cornfield, so mm. to speak. I began tracking the migration of indigenous peoples from Mexico, and I stumbled onto a map that said that uh, the Aztecs had come from somewhere in the north of what is today the US. So wait a second, Roberto. I always thought it was the Aztecs that started in Mexico and traveled north. So are you saying that the Aztecs came from what is now the United States? People are still talking about what a couple of duck hunters found in Lake Mills, Wisconsin more than 100 years ago. Their oar didn't slice smoothly through the water. It hit something, something hard. The guys took a closer look and saw what appeared to be a stone pyramid. It was the beginning of the legend of Rock Lake. What's more? Scuba divers who've gone looking for the underwater pyramids say there's a sea monster in Rock Lake. Rocky, Wisconsin's own Loch Ness monster, is said to fill divers with a sense of dread. I'm about to look for myself. It seems bizarre, but I just found out something else that seems crazy too. Almost all my investigations involve people coming to the United States in ancient times not the other way around. But I just learned that the Aztecs might have done the opposite, traveling from the US down to Mexico, where they built their empire. 
While I'm waiting for the submarines to be ready for my pyramid search here in Wisconsin, I need to find out more about Roberto's remarkable theory. I always thought that the Aztecs originated in Mexico, uh -huh. but are you saying that the Aztecs originated in what is now the United States? Well, there is lots of evidence that show a definite connection between peoples from Mexico and what is today the U.S. Southwest. I don't think there's a doubt that what people today call the Aztec, that they had connections through the Postecas. Those are the merchants. They yeah. would go throughout the continent trading, you know, copper bells, macaw feathers, all these different uh, implements, artifacts that we find today. What specific evidence do you have that ties the Aztecs to what is now the United States? Another piece of evidence are ancient maps. Uh, I would like to actually show them to you, spread them out so you can actually see what I'm talking about. Okay, great. Okay, let's go. If Roberto has credible evidence that the Aztecs began in what's now the United States, then went to Mexico, I want to see it. I know there are legends in Wisconsin that the Aztecs were here. I know corn is in abundance here, which was a sacred plant in their society. And I know the Aztec migration legend places their origin north of Mexico. Given those facts, the idea that Aztecs were here in Wisconsin is starting to sound more plausible. Maybe Roberto's maps have more clues. So I wanted to show you these maps. So here's the 1847 Discerno map. I originally thought that the Aztecs started in Mexico City and went north, mm -hmm. and you're saying that she started somewhere in the north and then ended up in Mexico City. Is that correct? The basic story is that they um, came from somewhere in the north in a place called Aztlan. Aztlan, the name of the Aztecs' mythical homeland, has a couple of possible meanings. Place of herons or place of whiteness. According to legend, the Aztecs' ancestors lived in Aztlan until their god, Huitzli Lapochtli, told them to head south until they saw an eagle on top of a cactus devouring a snake. The eagle eating the snake or the serpent, I mean, I've seen that imagery before. Yeah, no, and the reason you have, and most people have also, is that in the Mexican flag, uh, you have yeah. that symbolism. Uh, there's the eagle, mm -hmm. the serpent, and the um, the cactus. Now, this particular map has that imagery also. Oh, it's the same thing. Yeah. Well, I've been a journalist most of my life. In about the mid-90s, somebody mailed me the entire map uh, anonymously with a note saying, please put it to good use. The map is part of the Treaty of Hidalgo, the agreement signed in 1848, which ended the Mexican-American War. Mexico surrendered nine states, including California and Texas. The treaty map is one of the last times the Aztecs' American origins are ever mentioned in print. Here it is blown up. One of the first things that I find in here uh, on the confluence of the Colorado and the Green River, and that's in the Four Corners region okay. of the U.S., is the Antigua Residencia de los Aztecas. Does that say the ancient home of the Aztecs? Absolutely. Combining a modern map of the United States with the 1847 treaty map suggests that the ancient home of the Aztecs could be the American Southwest. But could there be a connection to Wisconsin too? How come I've never heard of this before? Well, the more amazing story is that I, I found actually 200 maps older than this one, going from 1847 all the way to the 1500s, tracking the same story except that the older ones show Salt Lake as the point of origin. Great Salt Lake is the largest inland body of salt water in the Western Hemisphere. It's located in the northern part of Utah. Because see, the story about the Mexican Indians or the Aztecs coming from the north is that they came from a body of water in an island. And so all the older maps show Salt Lake. It's amazing. So this body of water was the, was Great Salt Lake? Exactly. Well, I'm not telling you that it's correct, but I can guarantee you that there is a map tradition going 300 years 
that is from the 1500s to 1847. After the war, the, all this stuff magically disappears. Sure enough, when we compare the treaty map with one that was published 21 years later, there's no mention of the Antigua Residencia de los Aztecas, the ancient home of the Aztecs. Okay, do you think that there was a deliberate attempt to get rid of this information? This country, they're used to telling people to go back, you know, go back where you came from. And if they're used to doing that, implying go back to Mexico, uh, well, this would throw the story off because to tell them to go back, they'd have to go back to the Four Corners. That is incredible. Yeah. Wow. Well, I have to say that this evidence on the map and the, the legend of the migration of the Aztec over a period of at least a couple hundred years is really compelling. But is it possible maybe they originated up here in Wisconsin? Is there any other evidence that you found that makes this connection? Probably the biggest evidence is the language. What we today call the Aztec uh, spoke Nahuatl, and Nahuatl is part of a larger family, the Uto Azteca language, and that language goes from Canada Canada. All the way down to uh, Central America. For instance, Michigan and Michoacan have the identical meaning. It's a place of fishes. The word for shoe in the Nahuatl language is mokatsin. Mokatsin, yeah. moccasin. It's almost identical. So these words that I've talked about, they actually mean the same thing on opposite ends of North America. I always say that the borders we have are in our minds, not, right. in, not in geography, because you have many hundreds of mounds, mound cultures in this area. So it's not very, un it's not unreasonable to think that these people are connected to the peoples down here. That, that's not uh, out of the realm of possibility. Well, Roberto, you've really presented compelling evidence with your maps that the Aztecs didn't originate in Mexico City, that they came from the United States. It's all starting to make sense. The maps, the Aztecs' origin story, and the linguistics, they all suggest the same thing, that the Aztecs got their start in what's now the United States. I'm not certain if they were ever here in Wisconsin, where rumors of underwater pyramids and Rocky, Wisconsin's own Loch Ness Monster, persist. But I'm about to find out. The subs are ready, and soon I'll start my underwater search of Rock Lake. Hey, Russell. Hey, Scott. You ready to go? Well, you bet I'm ready to go. If we find something, is there any way to get out and take a look? Well, this has been engineered specifically for that purpose. Okay. In fact, uh, you just let the air out of the dome, you unlatch latch the hatches, put a mask on, so you can get out and look at it. When you're done with that, you can swim back in, lock it down, and once that air pocket is restored, off you go and you're, you're on your way again. All right, well, that's great. Should we get started? Yep. Scott, I'm a great believer in hands-on experience. All right. So here, let's take a look here. Uh, why don't you... Uh, Step up on the edge and into the middle of the seat. All right. Yep. I'd like to get you familiar with how these things steer. OK. And the center console, you pull it backwards and forwards, and you see your boaters? OK. That's so, down. Yep. And that's for the right thruster, and that's for your left thruster. OK. So when you push them forward, your that thruster will go forward. When you pull them back, it'll go backwards. So let me just uh, and of then let you get a feel for it. So uh, hit your thrusters forward. Yep. Go, go all the way forward. Get some speed on it. Get a feel for it. it does turn on a dime. I don't know about you, Russ, but I'm ready to get out there. I did a couple practice dives near the shore, but we've still got some battery power left. Now we're gonna boat out to where the underwater pyramids are supposedly located. I'm excited to go deeper with the Fugasa. 
but I'm even more pumped to see what the Aztecs may have left behind. Well, Russ, if there's an Aztec pyramid down there or the Rock Lake Monster, we're about to find out. More than a hundred years ago, a couple guys in Wisconsin supposedly stumbled upon an underwater pyramid in Rock Lake. Locals think the Aztecs may have something to do with this Midwest mystery. There's strong evidence, maps, which support the idea that Aztecs got their start in the United States, not Mexico. I'm getting ready to dive down in search of the rumored Aztec pyramids. And that's not the only thing. Well, Russ, if there's an Aztec pyramid down there or the Rock Lake Monster, we're about to find out. Now I'm in a submarine beneath the surface of Rock Lake. I'm looking for more than just the pyramids. People say Rocky, Wisconsin's version of the Loch Ness Monster, is down here too. He's what's known as a cryptid. Cryptids aren't recognized by mainstream scientists, but they're often the stuff of legends. Animals like kangaroos and platypuses were once considered cryptids. It will be amazing if I find evidence of the creature known as Rocky, but that's not why I'm down here. First and foremost, I'm hunting for Aztec pyramids, or what's left of them. It's really murky out there. Even if the pyramids are down here, it's gonna be hard to spot them. And it's hard to maneuver with all these weeds. Hey, Scott, what kind of visibility have you got down there? All right, I think I'm cruising along here pretty good. There's a lot of weeds here. Um, I can see the bottom. I'm trying to stay off the bottom. Russ, I'm going nose down here. Ah, oh, I'm stuck in the mud. Scott, I think I see your bubbles. Are you there? Just pick up, all right? Oh, I gotta get out of here. I finally got unstuck. I'd really like to park this thing, but it has to be on firm ground. Not luck. Scott, can you pick up? I'm uh, not hearing you. All right, Russ, I'm seeing some rocks. Maybe if I follow the rocks, I'll find the pyramids that are supposed to be down here. All right, Scott, uh, it's probably time to come up now. I, the battery's been running quite a while. Yeah, 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 I'll be up in just a sec. There's one more thing I want to check out here. I really wish it weren't so murky. This visibility is really bad. I see things that look promising. But when I get close, it's nothing. Just more weeds, no pyramids. Come on, Scott, we need you to come up now. All right, I'll be up in just a minute here. There's a couple more things. I just want to check this out here. I think I got the hang of this thing. I'm going to keep going a little bit further. Scott, we need you to come up now. Come on. Damn it. I want to stay down here. But it sounds like Russell's going to kill me if I don't come up soon. I'm running out of time to spot the pyramids or Wisconsin's Loch Ness Monster. It's a shame we don't have more battery power and more daylight. I guess I'll have to head up to the surface, but I'm not happy about it. Well, guys, I didn't see anything I wanted to see, but that last dive was, was pretty good. Unfortunately, I didn't see any stone structures. That doesn't mean that there isn't something down here. It just means that we didn't find it today. It was a little creepy down there. I mean, it uh, just had an eerie feeling to it. 
kind of makes me wonder maybe there's something to these legends after all about uh, about whatever it was that's in this lake. Dark waters do that. You just don't always see what's going on. And we're used to seeing everything around us where we, we can get a better grasp on what's out there. But when it's dark like that, you're just uh, spooked by it. Maybe come in the springtime when the water's a little clearer, the weeds haven't grown up yet. I mean, I'm not ready to give up on this site. I think there's still a good possibility there could be something here. We just didn't find it today. I'm disappointed I didn't see pyramids in Rock Lake, but I've got one more lead that could help me connect the Aztecs with Wisconsin. The Aztecs' mythical homeland was Aztlan. Tomorrow, I'm going to a spot with virtually the same name, Aztlan State Park. I want to find out whether the places are connected and why they share the same name. Maybe the rumors are true and the Aztecs did spend time in Wisconsin. You know, as we talked about on the phone, I'm looking into the possibility of the Aztecs being in Wisconsin. And uh, I know you're familiar with the Rock Lake mystery. Mm -hmm. I just spent a whole day <laughs> in a mini sub down at the bottom of the lake looking for some of these underwater pyramids. I didn't see anything other than a few piles of rocks. I'm open to the possibility that there could be something there, but I haven't seen it. That pretty much matches our research too. Well, then why is it that everybody thinks that there's pyramids at the bottom of the lake. The answer is, in fact, here at Estelan State Park. Let me show you Estelan. I came to Wisconsin to check out stories of underwater pyramids some people think the Aztecs built. When I took my investigation beneath the surface of Rock Lake, I didn't find pyramids. I didn't find Rocky either, the underwater sea monster rumored to live there. But I'm not giving up. Right now, I'm at Aztalan State Park. It has virtually the same name as the Aztecs' mythical homeland, Aztlan. According to legend, the Aztecs came from a place in the north, and I still wonder if Wisconsin could be that place. I'm looking into the possibility of the Aztecs being in Wisconsin. Isn't Aztalan the ancient home of the Aztecs? This is Aztalan, right? Yeah. To get at that answer, I need to show you the site and to tell you more about it. Well, this is the northern outpost of a great civilization that arose after about 1,000 A.D. here in the upper Midwest. 1,000 A.D. was a big year in history, both here in America and elsewhere in the world. At the same time people were building this place, Viking explorer Leif Erikson was discovering North America. Gunpowder was being invented in China, and Henry I was the reigning king in England. Populations around the world were growing. Different groups were coming into power and conflicts were on the rise. And that's exactly what was happening here. This is a town uh, that, as you can see, by this reconstruction was heavily fortified. It is, in fact, one of the most heavily fortified archeological sites we know of uh, in Eastern North America. They weren't kidding around, were they? The logs were plastered with clay a foot thick on both sides. 
Bob, these walls are <laughs> massive. I mean, what were they afraid of? Well, these are clearly defensive. They had moved in with a group of local Indians, but other people in the area uh, were obviously not pleased to see these new people, these intruders competing for the resources right. on their lands. And so we believe that that stimulated a great deal of warfare. How do archaeologists know all this? Astalan uh, has undergone uh, ac archaeological excavations uh, for uh, over 100 years, the most important place. Uh, that has yielded information about this site is the town dump, <laughs> where people for generations threw out all of their garbage, built up in layers so we could study the history of the site and we can get detailed information on, for example, their diet. So what did they eat? Well, they were basically farmers. Uh, they grew corn, squash, uh, but they also hunted deer. Can you tell me a little bit about the layout of this place? Yeah, there's a great spot from which we can see the town. Let's go over there. To me, it seems like the layout of this place could be very telling. If it's laid out like Aztec sites in Mexico, that's important. I can't help but notice the pyramid-shaped mound. It reminds me of the pyramids the Aztecs built in Mexico. Aztec cities like Tenochtitlan had things like plazas and separate areas for the most important members of society. I wonder if any of those things are found here. Running down the center of the town was a public plaza. Very characteristic of towns in Mexico. Right. Where you have religious ceremonies, celebrations, festivals. At the highest portion of the site, uh, was a zone that appears to have been restricted for the elite, the, uh -huh. the most important people. So this, this is the highest point right here. This had to be an important person. This would be the chief's mound or the mm. ruler's mound. The mound uh, to the northwest uh, was a mound of death. As mm. people died, they put the newly dead alongside the people who had died in that family uh, previously. Um, I mean, wouldn't there be an odor permeating the plaza? Yeah, but in ancient world, um, they were used to many things that we are not okay. uh, today. Uh, and the smell of death is certainly one odor uh, that they would not have uh, found objectionable. That mound over there, what was its purpose? That was the base for the temple, where the sacred fire of the community was kept by special priests. Okay. It was not to be put out except for once a year when they began uh, the agricultural new year. And native people conducted, and in fact still conduct, uh, a ceremony called the green corn ceremony which celebrates the, the new agriculture year. The corn is coming in. That's the New Year celebration for them. It's a New Year celebration. The people here were obsessed with corn, just like the Aztecs were. When I met with Roberto in the cornfield just west of here, he told me that corn was the Aztecs' most sacred crop. And I learned they even had corn gods. It seems more and more likely to me that there could be a connection between the people who lived here and the Aztecs. Now, one of the most interesting aspects is the very last mound, the furthest away from the town, did have a human burial. Oh. And that was of a young woman. Um, How old? Between 18, 21 years old, okay. young woman, who was buried with thousands of beautiful shell beads associated with very high status, very important people. Could she have been sacrificed? She, in fact, may have been a sacrifice or an offering uh, during a drought. The question becomes, what happens if the corn doesn't come? Exactly, the ultimate offering, one of their young princesses. So it sounds like the practices that you've described here are a lot like the Aztecs. The Aztecs were a corn-based culture. So were the people who lived here at Aztalan. Aztec cities had plazas and special areas for elite members of their society. So did the town of Aztalan. 
The Aztecs were legendary for their practice of sacrificing humans to the gods. The people who lived at Aztlan appear to have done the same thing. It seems like there has to be some kind of connection, some kind of influence between the two groups. The name Aztlan, I mean, isn't that associated with the Aztecs too? The name Aztlan actually comes from an early settler who came out here, discovered the ruins of the site, and thought that they were similar to Aztec ruins. He read about the Aztecs and found out that they came from a homeland north of Mexico City and reasoned, well, this is north of Mexico City, so this must be the homeland of the Aztecs, Aztlan. The pieces seem to fit in his mind, so yep, exactly. why not? No, the Aztecs came much later. There's really no direct connection between that civilization and this place. Which begs the question, who were these people that built this site? The people from this site were from a totally different civilization. May have in contact with some Mexican people, but a different civilization that existed here in the Midwest called the Mississippians. A little over a thousand years ago, along the Mississippi River, this civilization created America's first city, the place we call Cahokia. Aztlan was the northern outpost. Okay. But that larger civilization stretched right down to the Gulf of Mexico. About 1200 AD, we see the abandonment of Aztlan. And throughout the north, the Mississippian civilization disappears, period. Bob doesn't think the Aztecs were ever here. But who's to say the Mississippians from up here in Wisconsin didn't become the Aztecs of America's Southwest and later Mexico? The timing makes sense. Bob says the Mississippians abandoned Aztlan around 1200 AD. The Aztecs were in Mexico in Tenochtitlan in 1323. That means they would have had more than 100 years to leave Wisconsin and travel south, spending time near Great Salt Lake and the Four Corners region along the way. I'm not saying it happened, but it is a possibility, even if Bob doesn't think so. So basically what you're saying is there are some similarities, but not necessarily a direct connection. It shouldn't surprise us that there are a great many similarities between the customs of North American people, like at Astolan, and Middle American people, because they literally did have common origins. Well, Bob, what I think is important that you mentioned is that there is evidence of contact between people in Mexico and people uh, in the central part of the United States going back in the distant past. And I think that's an important point. I knew exploring the Rock Lake Pyramids would be an underwater adventure but I wish my descent into Rock Lake would have been more productive. I wasn't able to see the pyramids locals believe the Aztecs made or the legendary lake monster. There may be piles of rocks in Rock Lake, but it's more likely that glaciers, not the Aztecs, put them there. I am convinced the Aztecs began in the US, then made their way to Mexico, not the other way around. We've got good map evidence that links the Aztecs to the American Southwest. And given the similarities between the Aztecs and the Mississippians, there might even be a connection there too. After seeing Aztlan and hearing about Cahokia, I'm more interested than ever in investigating mysteries in the Midwest. I think there's a lot left to learn.